by giving us a presentation down from Jersey City. I think you might know him. His name's Al Clays, and he happens to be our technical coordinator. And he will be telling us all about the understand how to understand the American the, the All American Five and the evolution of its engineering masterpiece. So, Al, take it away. Okay, am I on mute? It? I think so. You're good. Okay. Uh, this all started with some conversations a couple of months ago. Uh, uh, we, you know, minutia about all American fives and where to hook up the power cord and things. And um, I had never paid a lot of attention to these things. I, they're not my kind of radio. But I started looking around and, and started with uh, Wikipedia. They had an All American Five article, but they claimed that the All American Five was the first ACDC radio. And yeah. I knew that that was completely wrong. So let me go see if I can straighten this out and figure out what really happened here. Uh, the motivation behind a radio like the All American Five is you got to remember that, that radio was a really hot thing during the 20s on into the 30s. And there was a tremendous market potential here. There's some numbers over here for uh, sets sold in various years and it climbed all through the 20s. But these radios were pretty expensive, you know, $100, maybe $200 was not uncommon. And this was in an era where, you know, a buck an hour was good wages. And you got to multiply those prices by 18 or 20 to really understand what was going on. So a $20 radio that actually worked would be a hot item. And so people looked into doing things like that. Um, so, you know, the, the challenges here, you know, we're not talking about weak radios like Crosley Pups and stuff like that. We're, we're talking about, you know, a radio that will actually work. Um, you got to get the power transformer out of it because that's a, a major cost item. Uh, DC operation might help you sell radios in New York City where there was still some DC uh, distribution to homes. And you gotta just beat the overall bill of materials down, cut down the part count, get rid of anything expensive in there, uh, things like big power resistors and electrodynamic speakers uh, were always costing you money. So uh, this is you know, sort of 1930-ish and what are you, you going to do? Uh, so the solutions come in the way of innovative circuitry and improved vacuum tube technology and tubes that were designed specifically to operate in this environment, in, in particular series heater string tubes. And Another couple of factors are if you can make the size small where well, you're going to spend less money on the wood or plastic or whatever that you make the cabinet out of as well as the chassis and plastics come on the scene so you can go ahead and, and mold cabinets and things and, and save some money there. Uh, this is a technical presentation so uh, uh, read, read the freaking schematic along with me. I, I always sort of uh, emphasize that a little bit. Uh, and if you're learning to read schematics, I'll sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of bring you along here. So all this radio stuff was based on triode tubes. And, you know, I think we all sort of know about this. You had a filament, a grid, and a plate. And that was good. And that got radio, that got real electronics started, but there were some, some shortcomings there. Uh, you hook one of these things up and uh, you know you have an A battery that heats the filament, you have a B battery that's actually supplying the power, and you have a C battery that sets the operating voltage on the grid. If you look at this, this chart over here, you have signals coming in, an input voltage and an output current. And so what you want to do is bias this thing, bring the C voltage up so that at zero signal, you're right in the middle of this nice straight curve 
and then your signals come out amplified but not distorted. So what's the problem with that? Well, voltage amplification in a triode might be seven and a half or maybe 10 if you're really lucky. And that kind of means that you need a whole bunch of these tubes to do, to do anything profitable. But there's the, an even bigger problem. And that is when you have a three element vacuum tube, you've got a metal grid here and a metal plate here, and that's actually a capacitor. And this thing's amplifying voltages that come in when the grid goes high, the plate goes low. And some of that signal comes back through this random capacitor here. And that's, uh, that's negative feedback. That's cutting down your gain. And uh, as you go higher in frequency, this becomes more of a factor. You know, a typical triode, this capacitance might be 10 picofarads and at a megahertz, you know, that's getting down to be 16 K ohms. So that, you know, vacuum tube circuit, that's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of feedback. So, but you could build a pretty nice radio out of triodes. And here's, here's a, 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 a TRF from about 1929. I, I just picked this one because uh, my grandparents had this radio. I still have it. Uh, but, you know, this thing cost about 200 bucks. And the reason was, well, there's nine vacuum tubes. When you look at a schematic, start in the left, there's an antenna. Over here on the right, there's connections for a speaker. And you got all this stuff going on in here. And uh, so you had triode, four, three triodes being RF, ampl actually four triodes being RF amplifiers, another triode as a detector. And now to get sufficient amplification in the audio stages, you depend on transformers to take the 5x gain here, multiply it by three before you run into the next stage, do that again with another transformer. And it's an AC set, so you have a big ugly power transformer. You've also got a, 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 a filter choke. So all of that adds up to money. And uh, while it's a nice radio, it's an expensive radio. So part of the problem to all of this was improved vacuum tubes. And if you look at that, if you look at that triode where you have the grid and the plate and its capacitor, well, what if, what if we just stuck a piece of metal, it stuck a shield in between those two capacitor plates? Then you end up with this situation up here. And because you got this ground in here, these two capacitors are isolated, so you don't have any feedback. Well, how do we actually do that in a tube? We can't stick a metal plate in there because then the electrons can't get through. The solution was, you add another grid. Here's a so-called tetrode because it has four elements and the signal comes in on this grid. And then this screen grid is, has high voltage on it, B plus, but it's bypassed the ground for signal. So that, isolates the plate from the grid capacitively, and the signal comes through in the electron stream right through the second, right through the screen grid. So this gets you more amplification and solves the high frequency problem. Uh, the way these things actually look, if you look inside them, you've got the, the heater inside and the signal grid, and then you have this screen grid. And in fact, you'll find some of these old tubes where the screen grid actually comes around the top and all the way around and shields the plates on the outside. I'm not entirely sure why they did that, but a lot of the early tubes like the, the 224s that you find in some of the TRF sets did that. So the amplifier looks like this. You've got your input to the grid. You've got your B plus, which goes to the plate and to the screen grid. And you know, that drawing I showed you earlier, the triode amplifier, they show these batteries all over the place. Well, that isn't the way you really do it. For instance, in an amplifier like this, you put a resistor in the cathode circuit, currents being drawn this way, that generates a voltage drop here, and it's 
more positive on this end to that end, and this end through ground is connected back to the grid. So you have a negative bias on the grid, the C bias. It's called self bias by virtue of, of that resistor. So this makes you a pretty good amplifier that's got a fair amount of gain, even at radio frequencies. So with the Tetrode, it's win-win. You get rid of the degenerative feedback, so it makes effective RF amplifiers possible. And the other thing, and this is a little more subtle, is that fixed screen voltage, the actual, the, the actual control grid is just controlling the current to the screen grid, which goes on through. So the current in the output, it becomes a current source. So if you make the output load higher in resistance or impedance, you get more gain out of the thing. And so you hook a tune circuit up there like an IF transformer, and you can get astronomical gain out of a tube like this compared to a triode. So we're, we're starting to you know, get to where we can get rid of some of those nine tubes in that, in that TRF set. Um, there, is a, there is a problem with the tetrodes, and that is if you look at, if you, they, they draw characteristic curves for, for tubes. This is plate voltage across this way and plate current this way. And you'll notice that these curves come up and make a little dip like that and go like this. And that kink in the curve causes you trouble, it can break into oscillation or whatnot. And so the tetrodes don't last all that long before they solve that problem with the pentode tube. Same kind of thing, your cathode, control grid, screen grid, and now they add another grid that straightens out that kink in the, in the curve. This grid is normally just grounded, but the pentode is what we settle in on for, uh, for amplifier tubes. Uh, this is a little bit later one, a, a metal tube like a, a 6SK7 or whatever. But uh, so the pentode becomes real important. Uh, now, one of the things about pentodes is you have all this gain and you want to control that amplification back in the the days of the battery sets and the 201As, you just turned the voltage down on the, on the filament and the thing would sag down, you have less gain. But you can change the gain of, a pen, of any of these tubes by changing the bias voltage on the grid. Like here, if we were to bias that at, I don't know, two and a half volts, and you're way up on this curve, and the gain is proportional to the slope of the curve. So normal amplification, you're up in here, you got a lot of gain. And if you change the bias down here where the curve is not so abrupt, you get less gain. But pretty soon you cut the tube off and it doesn't amplify at all. So they invent this thing called remote cutoff. And here's, here's the control grid of a remote cutoff tube. And you'll notice that grids are usually evenly spaced, but you get toward the middle of this one and the spacing widens out for a while and then goes back to being tight. And what this does to this curve is as you pull the control grid voltage down, instead of cutting off back here, this curve comes way down here and you can see the very gentle slope here, it cuts the gain way down. So you have electronic gain control in these tubes, and that becomes important for automatic volume control in later in real radios. The other innovation that comes in, uh, the early tubes were all filament tubes, and there's some problems there. When you try to run the filaments on AC, now you've got hum making its way into the circuits. And so the solution there is you put the filament, you insulate it, you stick it inside a metal tube, and you put the right chemicals on the tube. So when you heat it red hot, it becomes a heater and it emits electrons. So the, the AC tubes come in, the heater type tubes, and that's an improvement as well. Okay, 
let's let's build a radio. Okay, and this one is an Erla from 1931, and it's actually a DC radio. You you know you're living in New York, you connect your 115 volts DC in here. We've got a screen grid tube. Now they they designed six volt heater type tubes for automobile radios. We've got a screen grid tube as, a, as an RF amplifier that gets you a fair amount of gain. We use the same tube as a pento detector that does the detection, gets you some audio gain. Uh, we've got type 38 power amplifier tubes, except when you're running them on low voltage, 115 volts on the plates, they don't get you a lot of gain. And so the, their solution here was, let's wire two of these in parallel. Now, we need to light up the filaments from the 120, 115 volt input. We've got six volt tubes that draw 300 mils a piece. One, two, three, four tubes, that's 24 volts. And we've got to get rid of the rest of that to make up 115, 120. So we have a pilot light in series, and I wonder what pilot light that was, because that's hard to keep one working in that part of the circuit. We have the speaker field coil, and then we have a big resistor. And all of this stuff is wasting 27 watts just to light up the filaments. Uh, stick your hand on top of a 25 watt light bulb sometime, and that'll give you an idea, you know, what, what the problem really was here. And uh, these power resistors, you know, lead to things like these resistor tubes and ballast tubes and things like that. It's not a great solution, but it was a, a viable solution. So they built these little DC radios, price was pretty low. And, you know, TRF, two tuned circuits, well, it had worked. It was, you know, way better than a crystal set. Um, in the same era, here's, Here's a real AC-DC set, a DeWalt 54. And this is the same kind of situation. Uh, now, these guys, these guys moved up to a pentode in this TRF stage and uh, kept a pentode in the detector. Uh, a, type, a Type 38 AF, they managed it with one tube. Now, we're running an AC, so we need a rectifier. So they took not one, but two. Now, one of the problems here is that if a tube is gonna handle power, that is handle higher currents, you need to feed more power into the heaters. And these heaters are all 300 mils. So to be able to handle more power, they took, they took two of these triode tubes that they wired up as diodes, put them in parallel, and, and use those to rectify the AC coming in. Uh, the, uh, the volume control in this radio is by varying the uh, cathode resistor on the RF amp, and uh, it's a, a remote cutoff tube, so that gives them volume control there. There's no pot, no audio pot on the way out the AF amplifier. All of this stuff just runs wide open. You've still got a, a, an electrodynamic speaker with a field coil. And uh, you know, this is a start. It's an AC-DC radio. Uh, the All-American 5 was not the first AC-DC radio. We'll get there. But this is, this is the kind of thing you start it with. And you don't quite have the right tubes. I mean, here you are using audio triodes to make, to make rectifiers. Uh, now, there's another capacity problem with vacuum tubes. And especially when you go to build a super heterodyne receiver where you have a, a converter stage. The Brits call it a frequency changer, which is a whole lot more descriptive. We've got this pentode tube here, and the signals come in off the air through a tuned circuit. Let's say we listen to WABC, comes in here. Now, we have an oscillator 
running at 1225. And we feed that signal into the grid too. And we get the, we get a mixing, a beat phenomena where you get the difference frequency, which happens to be 455. You run that into your transformer and maybe out to another amplifier and there you go. Well, one of the problems here is that this tuned circuit in the oscillator, because it's capacitively coupled to this tuned circuit, you can start tuning this guy or changing the load on the antenna, then you pull the oscillator frequency. And one of the things that was happening in the 30s is shortwave listening was starting to come in. So you got to move all this to higher frequencies and this problem gets worse and worse as you go. So what's the solution? Well, <clears throat> if instead of having a, a triode oscillator down here, we use a pentode, we can set up the oscillator to work on the, the signal grid and the screen grid. And then the signal we're generating there is carried through by the electron stream. This is called an electron couple oscillator to the plate circuit. And we can connect that to the mixer with impunity and not have any pulling. So that was, you know, a step forward. But we still have two tubes for the input to this radio. And we're trying to cut things down, you know, as far as we possibly can. So they invent the heptode. Now, contrary to popular opinion, a heptode is not a, an amphibian that's with it. Uh, but we make a special tube. And so it starts out being a pentode. You've got a cathode and a signal grid and the screen grid. But then we put another signal grid in here and give it another screen grid. So cut the signal coming in. This looks like a pentode. The oscillator looks like a pentode. So we can have an oscillator and a mixer in the same tube and not have any oscillator pulling, use electron coupling to get the oscillator mixed into the input signal. And then we put a remote, this, this second signal grid here, we give it remote cutoff characteristics so we can get automatic, so we can get volume, so we can get gain control, and ultimately we can feed a signal back in here and have automatic volume control. So this is the pentagrid converter. Heptode's kind of an old-fashioned word, but I, I kind of like it, but you'll hear them called pentagrid converters. So here we're going to look at a somewhat more modern radio. This is a, an Emerson from 1933. And sure enough, they have a 6A7, they say composite, but it's a pentagrid converter. You see the tune circuit on the input here, another tune circuit down here for the oscillator. Uh, this particular radio also had a, a, a long wave band on it, so there's a band switch, and that's why you have some extra coils out here. But then, so it was the converter into the IF, which is another, uh, an, an, another pentode, into a detector, which is still a pentode, the remote cutoff pentode, sharp cutoff pentode. But now, improvement here, we have a power tube with a 25 volt heater. So it'll have more, uh, more current capability. And now we also have a 25 volt uh, rectifier tube. So that will, get us a decent power supply. And so you got three sixes are 18 plus 50. So you, you, you get this power you're throwing away down to nine watts. That's an improvement. Uh, the, the volume control here, you can't really do automatic volume control with a pentode detector or a triode even. Uh, you need a diode there, and there just weren't any appropriate tubes at this time. Yeah, you could take a, a triode and wire it as a diode, but then that's going to up your parts count. So the volume control is still this potentiometer out here, 
that goes to ground and you pull it over this way and it shorts out the antenna input and also raises the bias voltage on the IF and cuts that, that gain down. It looks like there might be a hint of automatic volume control here, but they don't really say it. And you're seeing this situation out here for the actual, the actual volume control. So that's Emerson 1933. We're, we're, we're coming right along. Uh, we're making progress. Um, okay, early 1935. Here's another Emerson, the Miracle 6. 6-2 uh, performance in a compact. It's actually four tubes. And here we see the price get down to 20 bucks. Well, 1995, just like all that stuff you see advertised on television today. That's still up 376 bucks in today's money, but this is a low price radio and kind of kind of important milestone here. So we still have the 6A7 pedigree converter uh, to cut the, the parts count down. There's now a tube called 6F7, which is a triode and a pentode. So they used the triode stage as an IF and the pentode as a detector. That same, the same 25 volt tubes here and here. Uh, you still have, uh, you still have gain control out here by a pot shorting the input and changing the bias on the tube. But now you have, a feedback loop here, which was an advertised feature, automatic overload control. This is sort of halfway automatic volume control, but at least as you tune across the band, it's not gonna, it's not gonna blast you out of your seat. Um, now, one of the things in all of these radios is, and you, you've, you've restored some of these and you, you run into, you know, eight and 10 and 12 microfarad filter caps. And when your caps are that small, you still end up needing to choke to build a proper filter. So that's another, another cost element. Uh, this particular radio, they've got 74 volts in the series string heater. They need to get rid of some more voltage. So they have a resistor built into the line cord. This is the infamous curtain burner line cord. They could screw up and get hot and you could have a fire problem. But uh, that's how they fit all that stuff into a small box. I've got the 17 watts outside the box. That's early ACDC 1935 with Emerson. Hey, Al. Yes. Uh, what what happened? The R the RF amp was that part of the oscillator mixer? Yeah, 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 yeah. You have you have you have the first grid and the screen grid involved as the oscillator, and then the signal comes in to the third grid, and the as far as that signal grid is concerned, it's looking like a pentode, so that gets amplified, but it's also being mixed with the oscillator signal that's modulating the, the, the current through the tube. So that's, that's that, that's that, uh, that's th this situation that we saw back here, pedigreed converter. And so that gets you two tube functions in one. And because it's a, because it's a pentode for the signal, you have a, a reasonable amount of gain through that too. So, uh, you know, it's it, you're starting to get a reasonable performing radio for for minimal for minimal parts. Uh, moving on to 1938, uh, now we see the the real the real AA5 come into play. First thing they did was design some tubes that instead of having those six volt 300 milliamp heaters now have 12 volt, 150 milliamp heaters. That's the same amount of power into the heater. So, so it's gonna work the same way. They, 
there was there was a bunch of progress made in pedigree converters, and it was largely driven by the short wave thing. They went through a couple changes, finally got to 6AS7 and 12AS7, which are real good converters. Pentode in the IF, and between these, you now have enough gain that you can work with an internal loop antenna. Now, that saves the customer money in that he doesn't have the additional need for, for an external antenna and or the six feet of wire draping down the back that largely picks up noise and causes trouble. So we've got the, the internal loop, we've got a bunch of gain, and now we've got this dual diode triode. So now we have a real diode detector here. We'll talk about this a little more on the next page, I have another schematic. Um, interestingly enough, this radio also had an integrated circuit. I'm not sure exactly what form it took, but they had one component that had the resistors and capacitors that did the coupling from the first uh, audio amplifier into the grid of the power tube. We've got a new tube here, the 50L6, uh, and a new rectifier down here the 35Z5. So we've now got a series string that heats, that adds up to about 120 volts. We don't have to waste anything in a resistor. Let's look at a slightly later radio that's a clearer schematic. We'll talk about some of this stuff in detail here. So like I said, internal loop, high performance converter, lots of, lots of amplification in the IF. Now, because you have a diode detector here, that, gets, that works better and you get enough signal here that you can have real automatic volume control back this way to this remote cutoff grid and this remote cutoff grid. So the front end of the radio takes care of itself and you have a volume control that you'd recognize here that just varies the amount of audio going into the grid here. Um, that 50L6 can get you two watts out, which ain't bad on the limited, uh, the limited B plus you have. That's a really uh, a respectable output. Uh, the, the, the technology and magnets has improved such that we have a PM speaker, which saves money and you don't have to have, have a field coil and all that kind of stuff. Capacitors have improved to where you can get electrolytics with reasonably high values. You'll see here uh, 50 and 20 microfarads, or is it 50 and 30? And that allows you to get rid of that filter choke and just put a resistor in there. And uh, as I said, the heater string is 150 mils, no resistors. And oh yeah, there's a tap on that 35Z5 filament so you can put a standard six volt pilot lamp in here. We'll talk about that a little more here in the in the future. But uh, pilot lamps had been a problem all along and here's a good solution. So you have a really high performing radio with a minimum of parts and you know specially designed tubes and that's your that's your all American five. Um, Circuit was sufficiently good <clears> that you could even build sort of a communication receiver out of it. Uh, this is the, the infamous Hallicrafters S38 uh, right after the war. And it's the same AA5 circuit, uh, but tunes, tunes all the way up to 31 megahertz in four bands. And um, they, you, Communication receiver, generally, generally you want to be able to receive Morse code, CW, which means you have to have a beat frequency oscillator. Well, they have a switch here that switches an extra capacitor into the IF, makes the IF oscillate, and sure enough, you can hear, you can hear CW on the receiver. Uh, other things that make it a communication receiver, you have a switch here that mutes the receiver and will switch an external relay to switch your antenna and turn on your transmitter. 
So I just thought this was interesting. You know, for 50 bucks, you could have a communications receiver brand new as a result of the AA5 circuit. Excuse me, just a second. A couple of fine points about the uh, the filament circuit and the pilot light circuit in the AA5. So we got this this heater loop here that's 150 mils, and we have this tap in the 35Z5, which if it's going to light up all the way, wants 150 mils, but we put this 150 mil pilot light across here. Well, that isn't quite what you want. So what they do is power is coming in from the line here. It's lighting the pilot light and that much of the tube, but that's the circuit that's feeding power into the rectifier to power the radio. So there's this balancing act going on between the pilot light and a 35Z5, and it works out pretty well. But the caution here is when your pilot light burns out, you want to replace it because you're kind of beating up the 35Z5. And, you know, after another 50 or 100 on off cycles, uh, this gives up and now you're replacing the tube. But uh, this is pretty clever. It works. And this explains why when you turn one of these radios on, the pilot light comes up pretty bright and then sags down to nothing. But then as the radio heats up and starts working, it pulls B plus and pulls more, more current through the pilot light. The pilot light comes back up to the normal, uh, the normal brightness. That's also why sometimes in these radios, if you, if you play them at really high volume, you'll see the pilot light dim as the, uh, as the current, as the B plus current varies. But uh, that's pretty clever. And uh, uh, that was the, the pilot light solution in the end here. Uh, some other fine points. Of course, one side of the, one side of the power coming in is going to be circuit ground, at least, if not chassis ground. You put the heater of the tube most sensitive to hum connected to ground. That's the detector audio amplifier, and then the other ones at higher voltages until you get to the 50L6 and the rectifier that don't care, and they're connected. Now, another fine point, and John Stoll made me aware of this, thank you, because there's a, a lot of discussion about, well, why'd they put the power switch in the ground side of the circuit? And there was all this, well, maybe we ought to move the switch over here and make it safer or something like that. Folks, it's lever right, lever right there, because that's how it was designed, and here's why. That switch is on the back of the volume control, which is also getting the low level audio that's feeding the triode grid. And so you don't want 120 volt AC anywhere near that. So when the switch is closed, this circuit is at circuit ground and you have minimal hum pickup into the rest of the radio. Uh, that's a, a very little known reason why they designed them this way. And you know, there, somebody was saying, oh, well, they saved one solder lug, so they put it on this side. That, that isn't the case. If John was right. It was to, to control, control the hum. So yeah. that, that's, uh, I thought that was an interesting point. Yeah. Yes. Uh, question elevator. No, go ahead. Okay. Now, can you can you hear me? Okay. Yep. I got the mic far away. Um, if you move the switch over to the other side, feeding the thirty-five Z five, but still leave the unswitched leg at you know neutral or ground. Yeah. But With now think about now think about it. You've yeah. moved the tube over here. You move the switch over here. Right. And the switch is 117 volts AC above circuit ground. Yeah. And it's right up, it's right up the back of the potentiometer. Yeah. So okay. that's, that, that's okay. a potential okay. hum pickup. Right. right. <laughs> okay. 
I don't know how severe it is. You might have to try it, see it and try. But my, my basic answer to all of this stuff is if you're afraid to use these radios in the, uh, in the way they were built, cut the power cord off it and put it up on the shelf. <laughs> okay, so um, there were a couple of different families of all American five tubes. Uh, the originals were octals, 12SA7, 12SK7, 12SQ, 50L630. Okay, meanwhile, you had Sylvania inventing the local tubes in, in uh, competition with octals. And uh, they, they had a line for all American five. Now, when their tubes say 14, there's still 12.6 tubes, but 12.6 is battery voltage in your car when the generator, when the battery's charged, but the generator's not running. 14 volts is battery voltage in your car when the, when the thing is, you know, when the motor's running and the, the battery's being floated. So they're really the same thing, but they used 14s and 7s and stuff like that. But they have a line of tubes, same functions, 50A5, 35Y4, and you'll see these. After World War II, the uh, miniature tubes came on the, on the scene, and there's a miniature AA5. You all know these, 12BE, 12BA, 12AT, 50C5, 35W4. Same functions, just shrunk down, stuck in, uh, stuck in the miniature tubes. Uh, really late on, you know, I think transistors were already starting to come out. Uh, they introduced a line of AA5 tubes that had 100 mil filaments. Heater. I keep saying filaments, I should be saying heater. 100 mil heaters, which, would, which in a small radio would reduce the, uh, the excess heat. And uh, you don't see too many of these, but they're eight, 18 volt tubes and then 34 and 36, same thing. Um, and when you really think about it, the battery set tubes, although it's not really all American five, uh, the same functions exist here. You have a, a pentagrid converter, uh, a good IF amplifier, uh, a, a tube with a diode in it to be a detector, and then a higher power tube to uh, be the power output. So that's my all American five story. Uh, any any questions or? Al, I have, I have a question. Sure. Um, uh, in, in that one line up there, you had twelve AT six. Uh, I find that uh, they use twelve AV six too, and that those two tubes are interchangeable. So why the heck do they have two tubes uh, that are I, similar? I, I, I'd have to go look. One of them might be high mu triode, and the other one might be a medium mu triode, which is a little different in gain. And you can you can kind of substitute those and get away with it. I'd maybe double check that, but like you say, they're pin wise, they're interchangeable. Uh, I'd have to go off and, and look at a book. I know the AT6 is a high mu triode. Uh, the AV might be a medium mu triode. I'm, I'm not sure, but it's it's something subtle like that. And now, then excellent excellent presentation. Is this going to be? Recorded so we can look at it later, or do you have something? Uh, yeah, I suspect that I suspect that Dave Sika will will put this up on uh, on YouTube, and sometimes he takes my presentations and my slides and integrates them into a you know a, a presentation. But of course, here in, here in Zoom, you already got this on the screen, so it may be okay just the way it is. But I'd expect this will be up on. Uh, this will be up on the YouTube page. Yeah, very excellent. Even if they just put the um, part of this presentation up on YouTube, it'll work great. Thanks. Right. Anything else? Maybe, hey, uh, Al, do you have any uh, plans on putting it on your website? Um, well, I might, but I, I usually don't don't steal the thunder of the club and you know, I can go ahead and do it. Um, uh, I'm, I, we'll, we'll see what happens. And if anybody... Yep. You know, if any if any if anybody wants the PowerPoint file, they're welcome to it. You know, that's uh, two two things. Al, yeah, we are recording it. We'll have it up on YouTube uh, pretty quick. And uh, I just looked up the tubes, by the way, and you're absolutely right. That is the difference between them. 
So the AT6 has a little more gain, and there may be cases where you don't need the gain, and you'd be, you'd be, you know, it'll just change where the, the position of your volume control is what it is. I thought but, it was the other way around. I thought it was the 12AV6 that uh, had a little more gain. I don't know. I may be wrong. I thought. I know, the, I know the, electrically the tube is identical. Yeah. But I think the, it's the AV6 has a little more gain. But when they switched to transistors, did they have the same store of circuit, all American five? Well, no, because well, the, so we're off at that point. The, the same functions are there, but see, now you don't have now you don't have to heat any any heaters, right? And the whole thing run wants to run on nine or twelve volts, so it's a whole different situation. Well, the transistors still had the same functions, but the reason they were six was your output was a push pull. So you still need to convert your IEF and whatever. Right, right. And uh, um, yeah, well, in the let's let's see, six transistors. I think I think the six transistors you ended up with with two IF amplifiers because they didn't have all that much gain. And in many cases, the uh, they used one transistor as an autodyne converter, which oh, okay. does mixing and oscillating all in one device. So it's a little bit different. I mean, it's still a super hat. So the the functions are the same that way, but they had to divide up the gain differently to make it work with okay. transistors. Another question, Al, about the Loctals. Yes. Wasn't Philco a proponent of the Loctals also? Yeah, Philco, Philco bought into that heavy as well. Uh, right. My understanding is that it was that it was a uh, uh, a Sylvania development, okay. but that Philco bought in. And, right, and I guess the, the, they push that as being uh, more durable, especially for automobile radios, right? Right, yeah, because it locks in and yeah, we can put it in upside down in a car radio and they could say it won't fall out and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, there were some pretty good local tubes and uh, uh, it was just two ways to go and two, two parts of the market. And then you find, you, you've seen the radios, you've seen the AA5s that have a, in fact, I, I have a Philco and it's, you know, it's, it's local tubes in the front end and then, a, you know, a 50L6 for the output tube. And then also around war, wartime too, didn't they mix and match with what they had available? Yeah, I'm sure there was, there, that stuff was going on too. So Al, somebody asked about uh, European radio, so I'll mimic the question. Uh, well, go ahead. Oh, you know anything? No, I don't. I, 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 mean, I think my, 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 I don't remember seeing such. Okay, and, and my, my guess is that when you try to do five tubes against 220 or 20, 20, 30 volts, whatever it is, that it becomes pretty unmanageable. And so I think most European radios had a, had a power transformer. Yeah, I've been looking at uh, the David Timpton, who's, uh, yep. Tipton, who's in Australia, 220 volts. And yeah, all the ones he messes with do have power transformers. I feel like if somebody, somebody at some point said there was a Japanese A5 lineup. Is that the last one there with the 18s? I don't know what they did. I mean, uh, the Japanese built a lot of tubes and a lot of radios. I don't know if there were any particular different tubes. I I, I think they were mostly, hmm. you know, Toshiba versions of, of these things. I, 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 like, I think they said something. I remember when somebody brought it up at one of our meetings, and it was like the, the ones they made for us at the very end were an AA5 design, but they weren't the same five tubes. So I wasn't sure if that was that many 100 ones at the end. Because yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what they were doing. I I think. Al, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the mini, the, the 100 milliamp tubes, that, that was RCA. It, and the only was. sets I've seen that actually have those tubes are RCAs. And I, I think that was an RCA thing. That was like a last gasp in the tube business. But yeah, that, that was a last gasp situation. I think I've only ever, ever seen one of those radios. I have a, actually an AM FM clock radio that has it, more than five tubes, but it has the it has those later 100 milliamp tubes in it. Right. Um, and the Japanese, I think I actually encountered yep. a Japanese set that did have a different string of tubes. Do you have internet? And 
the Japanese, you know, I guess remembering that they're 100 volt mains right. as opposed to 120. Yeah. And whatever. I think there was a difference. I don't, I, don't I think I still have it around. It was one of those late run little plastic uh, Japanese radios. I can um, tell you that as far as that last, that last 100 mil um, string, um, I, I only have, I have three of them. So much for, um, I don't know if you can see it, so much for reduced heat. Right, let me, let me get rid of uh, screen share here. If uh, uh, John. Uh, this is a, this is a silver tone. Two of the ones I have are silver tones and one is an Arvin and I suspect Arvin made the silver tones, but. The cabinets uh, warped here in the back where it got hot. One of the selling points on the 100 mils was that they were, you know, reduced heat. Well, I don't know. It's, you can't prove it by this radio. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a sort of a melted section in the back. Uh, this actually works very well. I actually ran it in a, a DX contest briefly just to, just for yuck, for giggles. Yeah, well, it's, it, it's kind of amazing how effective that circuit got after they leaned on it for a few years. And, uh, well, especially, I guess, with the ferrite bar antenna, I think that may have souped it up even more. Yeah, that probably helps better because it's, it's probably performs better than a, than a small air loop. And, and then, then later on, the uh, A5s had fewer and fewer components, they even knocked the amount of components down from the beginning. No? Yeah, well, you know, some of that, some of that integrated circuit stuff came back. There were these Pen, these couplet yep, things right, that, right. Were, that were uh, ceramic capacitors with resistors in them. Yeah, not just a couplet, but I see some of them were like you know maybe you know three resistors and four capacitors, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, it, it did that whole that whole trick in one piece. I I seem to remember reading an article once that was interesting, and I yeah about the end of the tube radios and when they stopped making them and all this. And apparently it would have happened sooner, but one of the things that kept the, the tube radios in production is because they could build the AA5 so cheaply without the power transformer. But if you wanted to build an AC powered uh, transistor radio, you had to have a power transformer. And apparently it was cheaper to build tube radios for a number of years oh, yeah. than it was to build AC transistor sets, which I found kind of interesting. But yeah, I guess well, it makes sense. I, I, Maybe somebody has a better take on this, but I kind of remember somebody commenting that the big trick in the 50s was to get the, the, the wholesale price of the AA5 tube set down to a dollar <laughs> for all five of them. Okay. Uh, it, if that's true, well, that kind of shows you, you know, uh, if you're going you're gonna to have to fight with $5 transistors to you know, to catch up with that. <laughs> when I was down in uh, Fort Knox for basic, we had a, uh, I picked up a uh, AC powered transistor radio with no power transformer, had a, a wire wand resistor, a porcelain wire wand resistor, and they did it without a power transformer. Yeah, well, you don't need a whole lot of power, so you can, yeah. I guess you can do that. Yeah, but that's terrible regulation, though, just putting a resistor in series. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, my recollection of what my dad told me about that whole era is that every manufacturer had a radio to retail for nine ninety five. Uh, got caused by the depression and continued, and I even remember it into the you know the late fifties and early sixties. So they could always find a radio for nine dollars and ninety five cents. wasn't a very good radio, but everybody had one. Go to Daviga. Um, Al. Yeah. Not to, not to, you know, Hallicrafters uh, geek out on you, but the S38 actually had a dedicated um, BFO tube. It wasn't until the 38A that they got smart and did that, or got cute, I should say, did that oscillating IF. Oh, okay. I, I guess I looked at, looked at one of the later schematics. Yeah, yeah they had a, a, a virtual BFO. They just had feedback in the IF, IF stage, yeah. I think. Yeah, that was, um, yeah. They, My but national, the, the original 38 was actually a six-tuber. <laughs> My national, uh, I forget the model number, equivalent to that Hallicrafters rig also had it's, the same oscillating SW54. IF. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Which, which they're, they're much scarcer than uh, 38s. Oh, there weren't near as many of, of yeah. those. 
Is that the one with the thumbnail? Thumbnail? Yeah. Thumbnail? Yes. Thumbnail? Yes. Yes. Thumbnail. Cute little thing. Yeah. It's cute, a, yeah. It's cute little thing. That's exactly it. <laughs> it was, wasn't that uh, prone for uh, chassis to cabinet short so you get fried with it? Well, it's a metal cabinet. I would, it wouldn't well, surprise me. Well, like me. Al said, then just cut the cord off and put it on the shelf. All right, man. That's <laughs> what don't I do. Don't be a wuss. <laughs> hey, Al. Uh, yeah. This is Marv. Uh, this isn't of my own uh, knowledge, but I, that L12 A AT6 and 12 AV6 deal, it, it rang a bell with me. And I remember when I was working on that TV in the shop, the, uh, the, the 12, it, it used the 12 AV6, I think, I'm not sure. It, and, and it had a, uh, a lead cap on it. In other words, like a, a tube shield, but it was made out of lead. So I, way back when I was working on it, I always wondered about that, what the purpose of it was. And, and the reason was that they were worried about microphonics and the, the, oh, it was a damper. The, tube, okay. the tube with the higher gain would be more microphonic than the tube with the lower gain. So I, I think that's, it has nothing to do about, it. in a radio, I didn't think it made a difference, but in that television, they were really worried about it because th this lead uh, shield was really heavy. That was and for x-rays. <laughs> it was supposed to be on the high voltage rectifier. You probably knew it. <laughs> well, Mar Marvin, they... Marvin, they, they, make was... those, they make those out of uh, silicone now and for the audio guys, and they charge you $500 a piece for them. Yeah, but, but the, the deal on, on this TV was, they was they worried about microphonics on that, and I don't remember which one they had in there. It was the 12 AV6 or 12 AT6, but uh, it was in the audio circuit, I know that. Or, but... Um, that that was the reason, because I know it rang a bell, and I just looked it up again, and that's what they were that's what they were talking about. I don't know, Al. It seems that uh, without the development of tubes in the 1930s into the 40s, there wouldn't be AA fives. Yeah, that's exactly it. You know, they they developed tubes especially to do this. I mean, in in many cases, while well, they were, you know, some, the 12 volt tubes were other versions of six volt tubes, but then you do the, the special power tube and the special rectifiers. And, and so you cover all the bases and just drive the cost of the whole thing down and, and keep the performance up. And the idea of a, a tabletop radio uh, in the thirties had to do with the, the depression. Yeah, oh the, yeah. The, the idea yeah. of a 995 radio, well, I don't, I think they cost more than that then, but uh, you know, in the middle of the height of the depression, 1933, 34, uh, they realize that uh, they're either going to go out of business or they've got to uh, defend the, uh, the product and get themselves into something smaller. Yeah, well, and, and like I said, they, the, the people who were looking at it knew there was this tremendous market potential. I mean, that, uh, that Macmillan that I showed you early on, the TRF set, uh, my, my, my great-grandmother died, and so my grandmother and grandfather had a minor inheritance and they put an indoor toilet in the house and bought a radio. Priorities. Nothing large. You know, and uh, that's, it was that big a deal. And, but they had a windfall, and so they had a radio. Was the radio first? I don't know. I don't know. It wasn't around. But the radio persisted until the mid-50s when they got a TV set. So there were even cheaper sets available, which used four tubes. Three tubes and a rectifier. <laughs> How did they pull that off? I have one. I have a jewel I was just messing with recently. Yeah, That's so do I. War II, the World yeah. War II issue kind of radio. I believe Emerson also made a three-tube ACDC set. Yep, so did uh, Arvin. Isn't there a, a, a 70L7? There's some tube that has a rectify, it's a self-rectifying tube or something like that? Or oh, yeah, 70 L7 and 117 yeah. L7, yeah. 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 30, they, 32 they, L7? Yeah, and I think there are miniature versions of them as well. There's a 117 Z3 or something like that. That's just a rectifier, though. There's no, no there, there's, I think there's a miniature version of that self-rectifying 
uh, and I think it was like it was an audio and a rectifier all in one. Well, I think I think they built one two record players with those things. Right, that was a one seventeen one seventeen L seven. Yeah, yeah, one, yeah. Then there's then they used them in phono oscillators and all that, but yeah. So so you guys are counting the number of tubes, but it seems to me that the more complicated tubes must have cost more to make. Wasn't there a trade-off there? Not, apparently not very big, because like I said, they, 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 well, that, somebody was talking about a, you know, a $10 retail radio. They beat the cost of those five tubes down to, to a buck for all five of them. I mean, the, uh, the way they produced those was, you know, real mass production and a lot of, a lot of fancy machines and whatnot, but Did anybody uh, have any issues marketing them when they were shrinking, like adding elements into the tubes? You know, because a lot of those old like Nutridines are like nine feet long, and I thought the point of it was like the dick measuring contest to have a million tubes. <laughs> I imagine at some point in time they had to convince people that there's less tubes, but because they do more stuff, right? I mean, well, the, the, you know, the, the Midwest, the the the. the the convincing people was, well, you want to you, you want to spend a hundred bucks for this radio, or do you want to spend twenty bucks for this radio that works almost as well? I think Great Depressions are good for that sort of. They're good convincing things, aren't they? They're good for convincing people to go cheaper. And you know, I would, I I would aside aside from the bigger speaker, if if I think back to that. Uh, that Macmillan, which I still own, by the way, uh, an AA5 table radio is probably just as good, maybe a better radio. So it wasn't like you were really giving anything up. Yeah, you have the, yeah, well, this is big and long and heavy, so it must be better. But uh, that didn't count for much when it so was a, a Any Any idea when the, uh, when the tube count Olympics really ended in, in radio marketing? The depression. Oh, well, Midwest made radios a long time. You had those uh, transistor radios that were advertised to themselves as six and seven and eight transistor radios. Uh, so I guess it went at least that long. Yeah, but some of those transistors are being used as diodes. For right, wire. so it was, it was just marketing. A triumph of marketing over engineering. Yeah, it was the my pillow of the era. Al, were you were you implying that 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 you that the, that your grandparents still had a TRF in use in the fifties? Yep. Wow. Yep. Worked just worked just fine for their purposes. They sounded very good because they were wide banded. Yeah, it was wide banded, and uh, like I said, it had a speaker yo big and. Uh, it, it sounded all it sounded good. I suspect if people had money, they probably wanted to get a big, expensive radio so they could feel better about themselves. So yeah. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, with there the was pride and joy in their living room. Yeah, I mean, you look look at the consoles and even even the nice table radios were a hundred bucks. You know, a Zenith shutter dial or something like that. Well, you know, but, it, it happened in the it happened in the video business back in the in the nineties or the aughts. I guess you know, video cameras didn't cost fifty or a hundred thousand dollars anymore. Uh, they cost five thousand dollars, and they were tiny. And I had a friend who had a hundred thousand dollars invested in a camera, and he was really pissed. He wanted to he wanted to build a big box that you could put the little camera inside and make it look like you had spent a lot of money on it because it just didn't seem right to him anymore. So you always spent a minimum for a five tube radio, and that's all the cows ever got. <laughs> You know, at the museum, when we show the, th the 30s, 40s radios, we always point out, we've got all these nice consoles, but most people had this other set of stuff, and we show some of the smaller radios, because they were just as good for a lot of the purposes they wanted. Except for bragging. Except some, for bragging. some people just couldn't afford it. You know, people starting well, out well, in a little apartment, a little studio apartment, you know, you didn't have money for a big well, company. No. During the Depression, some people couldn't afford it ever. Right, right. But, but by the way, I, I, I just had to look, and, and um, 6AV6 and 6AT6 are both um, high mu triodes, although 
a V6 has a higher, somewhat higher amplification factor. So I guess it's a little higher gain. I didn't know that either. I just, and was it that this reminded me there was some razzle dazzle, remember with 50 B5 and 50 C5 and the pinouts. And if you put tubes in the wrong way, you could, that's why they took the 50 B5 and made the 50 C5 out of it. Remember that? There's some, yeah, that's so there was, there was some screw up there with UL. Yeah. That you could plug the tube in the wrong socket and have a, have a shock hazard. Hmm. Because those ACDC sets didn't have any existing shock hazards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it did, didn't have enough. It but. amazes me if you think about it. I mean, I, it does never bothered me, but if you think about it, they used to make those Arvin, those metal radios, the ACDCs with the metal cabinets. I and have I, one. I, I say RCA to myself, made it. How, could, how did they make, I mean, I see ACDC set with a plastic knob and a plastic cabinet or a wooden cabinet, but a metal cabinet, I mean, that's like pretty blatantly. Uh, they, were, they were for men. Yeah. yeah. But the knobs were plastic and that's the only thing you're touching. Yeah, I, I guess, I guess you have I, a nice insulating coat of paint there. Yeah, and I yeah lead paint they very for, they were, they were in the lead, kids lead room when they dropped them they didn't uh, break right they were for you're supposed to use them around the bathtub to say know, that there was a point where UL uh, actually banned connecting the line hardwired to the metal chassis and required a capacitor did the UL ever do that? I don't know. The hot, the hot chassis sets kind of, I mean, the, the hot, yeah, the hot chassis sets kind of faded out. Uh, you know, all, all, I think all the, all the later ACDC sets were, you know, a, a, fl a, a floating circuit ground in there and then a, a bypass cap to the, to the chassis. If I remember correctly, Ed Lyon wrote something in the uh, Maryland, uh, uh, whatever their newspaper is, I forget, about five years ago about that very topic. Do you remember it, what Jules, said? It's, <laughs> it's, it's funny the things that come up on these uh, club discussions because uh, I don't know about the question that Jules asked, but I was just Googling here and the 50C5 was introduced because the underwriters laboratory did not like the fail mode of the 50B5. Hmm. I never knew that. I never even thought about it. Yeah, I don't remember the ins and outs, but I knew it was a UL thing. Mm. They objected to it. Question, it, does, our, does our capacitor group, do they supply safety caps? Did the club buy safety caps? Yes. Okay. Yes, Paul. I, I just didn't know. I didn't know about them much until very recently. <laughs> so now I'm looking for some. Uh, talk to uh, Joe Giliberti. He's got them. Yeah, okay. Hey, Al, that one radio in that in your presentation, you said it had a long wave band. What was on the long wave band? You know, I don't know what was going on there. Um, uh, I, you know, there, well, the airport control towers and and there were beacons and whatnot. I don't know if there was ever long wave broadcasting in this country. I really don't know what that was all about. And uh, I kind of stumbled onto that, and then I said, well, let me let me go. And and you know, the, that that radio number was like five H five L or something like that. And I went and looked at the H five, and it wasn't a superhead, which wasn't really what I wanted to show. It was more like the uh, the other one. So I stuck with the H five L, and I never found out what that was actually all about. But they well, I guess fine. the L stands for long wave. Yeah, but... for long wave. <laughs> had two bands that had right. this long wave band, and that's a little unusual. You know, I don't. You know, there was a, a time where you'd have a maybe uh, one shortwave, you know, even sort of low frequency shortwave band that would let you hear the police calls and things. When, when did when did RCA make the, the superhead design available at a reasonable price to other people? Oh, twenty eight or twenty nine. I don't know the. I thought it was later, like thirty one. No. I, I don't I don't know for sure. I was thinking twenty eight twenty nine, but uh, you know, well, yeah, I don't I don't don't know exactly. There was some it, big legal action that went on in nineteen thirty. That that could be. I mean, they kind of sat on it for for a long time, and 
Uh, it sounds like Empire of the Air stuff. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Hmm. Now you're talking about hot chassis and, and safety. Don't forget uh, the early 50s, well, mid 50s uh, uh, clock radios, which had the outlet in the back for your coffee maker. Right. About 800 watts coming through, and that's why I had the the thick extension cord on the back of it. Think about safety there. Yeah, I have one of those, oh, and I actually just, have uh, it in the basement. I got a little tingle one time when I touched when I stood on the uh, cement floor and tried to adjust the time. Well, anytime I'm working on something like that, that that outlet is the first thing to be clipped. It's yeah. still there, but it's clipped out. I just can't believe that uh, anything like that actually existed back then with the UL label on it. I just did a quick Google of the first manufactured Super Het, and it's saying 1923. That's the ARA-12. That's the RCA set. That was RCA, and and they built Super Hets for, for quite a while, but then they, they kind of backed off to TRFs. And then I don't know, late thirty, late twenties, they what model sixty four or something. They came with an AC superhead. But I, but I would go with Neville. I'll bet that around thirty or thirty one is when they actually started to license it to other people. Before that, you could not manufacture those things. Yeah, you were RCA. Lutz offered a number of kits, superhead yes. kits. Yes, we have one in the museum. Some of those Lutz could outperform anything that RCA uh, ma manufactured, and he proved that in a court, mm -hmm. even though anybody still wasn't allowed to sell it. He could sell the components but, and the plans, but he couldn't sell the radio. Yeah. Well, who came up with the AA5 then? Like, who was the first one? So obviously it's the thing that caught on, but someone made it. Well, you saw the progression there. But right. I think it was RCA tubes. RCA made the yeah the, okay the tubes. By, by the way, for reference, nineteen thirty one was the Philco seventy, and that's a super head. So you know they were obviously you know licensing it by nineteen thirty one. Any idea what they charge percent on the license? That, that you know, all that's interesting stuff, you know, because surely there was a royalty. And uh, one of the things that drove all of that was you could build a pretty nice TRF set for the broadcast band, but as soon as you started thinking about multi-band radios, then you know, I'm sorry, <laughs> let, let me let me pay RCA some money and we'll we'll build the superhead. Well, that's why some of the earlier sets, there are a few different manufacturers, but Philco is also one of them that in, I think it was, I want to say it was 1930, 29 or 30, they had the Model 20 chassis, but they actually made a console cabinet that used this Model 20 chassis and had a separate chassis alongside of it for short weight. Yeah, that so literally was two chassis and two tuners in the one cabinet, and this was factory. Yeah, that second, yeah. that second chassis was probably a converter. Yeah, yeah, there were there were. It's it's it, it is it is a converter, but this was a factory produced thing. There were a few manufacturers that were putting the converters in the cabinet from the factory. Not aftermarket. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've got, I've got one of those radios here that I foolishly bought years ago, and I don't, I never got around to restoring it. But it, it claims, you know, right in the front it says dual super heterodyne or something like that. It's shortwave converter in front of, in front of a super head. I think that's more like a 1933 or 34 radio, though. Yeah. Thanks for the yeah. problem. Oh, what's John got? 
That looks like a four oh, tuber. Yep, it, this is an Arvin four tuber. The the weird thing about this one is, you know, it, it's um it's miniature tubes. I would assume it was octals, but it's not. It's miniatures. Doesn't work. I have to yeah. dig into it. But there's a plug it in. See if you light up. Yeah. You have any idea what the retail price was, John? Uh, no. I bet I bet this was one of those. It probably well, was ten dollar radios. Or... Hey, you John, you want to sell it? It's missing a tube. <laughs> yeah, it's a, they they left out the IF stage, but they still don't work that badly, really. <laughs> Thing's got nothing but grills on it. <laughs> It, John, you saw the one you bought for me, right? It's really heating up. I gotta get out of here. Maybe it has a little metal back. No, the one I got from you was well, that one works. That's that, that's a, a black one. Yeah. It's octal tubes. You want to sell that one? I'll buy that one from you. <laughs> no, but you, you know where this came from? I don't know how many of you remember this. Um, <laughs> who re I know Ray does the Krantz auction down in South Jersey. Late yeah, I remember it. Krantz auction. That was there. Oh, yeah, Al, I, yeah, 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 I knew you were there, too. That's right. Aaron, I don't think I knew you at the time. But, yeah, that's, that's if I remember correctly, that's where I got this. Or, yeah. and that's, that's the one where uh, he shall remain nameless pretty much was the guy that, that stole the uh, Western Electric uh, microphone. Oh. <laughs> hey, uh, I've got a silver tone. Yeah, I think I think Arvin made them. Yeah, it's a four, uh, it's a four, yeah. four tube octal. Yep, yeah, I think Arvin made them for Silvertone. Yeah, I think I've got a, a one or two down in the dungeon. And then They're I just found this one, a plastic case, a, a Delmonico. This must be a, be a later that, one. That's Japanese. Yeah. So Delmonico is Nivico, which is which is JVC. Yeah, it, it, tells, it, it tells Jap, you know. Da, da. Yeah, it's, J, it's, it's actually JV, Vic, J, Japanese Victor. That, that was their export brand, I think. Yeah. Yeah, this uh, silver tone, though, I guess it's the original color. It looks like it's painted. It's a pale, like a pale blue. Now, is there a loop antenna in those things, or they run a wire out? It has a wire out. Wire, yeah, wire. okay. That, 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 angling participle. That, that's how you probably get enough gain to, to just come through the converter and... Yeah, I always wondered why they had a why the four tubers had a wire hank and not a loop antenna, and I just I never claimed cheaper. <laughs> right, not enough game. Yeah. Are you hey you guys? I'm going to split because I got to spend some time with sweetheart. So I'll see you, I guess, Tuesday afternoon. We'll see you, Fred. I hear crickets. Yeah, there's one in my uh, in my uh, workshop here in the corner. Where was that when you guys were telling jokes earlier? <laughs> hey, Al? Yeah. Okay, so this 4-2 Silvertone uh, is missing, I guess, a 12SK7. Yeah, there's uh -huh. no IF. There's no IF. No yeah, IF? But, what, but, the, but yeah, yeah, that's right. If it's missing the 12SK7, that would be the IF. Yeah. So there's a 12SA7 and a 12SQ and what, a 50L6 and a, and a 35Z4. Probably either. Like the radio version of a month's TV, right? There's hey. something about a month's TV. Yeah, Pro yeah. Probably, probably has only one IF transformer, too. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, does. Here's this a nice one-tube radio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, that, that's a no-tube radio. This is a one CRYS. The yeah. solid-state radio. This one here is a Jewel, and it uses miniature tubes. And of course it has the wire, but this is a little four tube jewel. And I've seen this same radio with five tubes. That's a deluxe version. <laughs> yeah, a jewel. And I have a, a somewhere it's inside, I have a clock radio version of this. Which jewel is made also, cute little radio. What's that? They made, they made cute little radios. It's really? also a four tube. It's the only four tube clock radio. No, that, and I think there's a GE that's also a four tube. That's Did they ever make a commercial sub-miniature radio, sub-miniature tubes, or were they all just for other things like curing aids? Oh, Motorola did. Yeah, they were, they were, they, they, they were sub-miniature battery tubes, and they had pocket radios. Yeah. That, that Actually, we have one in the museum, belongs to Ray Chase. 
Okay. But that was that was right at right at the end, and the transistors gobbled them up. Right. Actually, is it is a schematic in here? Can't read it though. Looks original. It's got the original antenna with a little uh, cardboard wind up thingy. Wasn't that um, that hop along Cassidy a four tube? I know it's a very collectible because it had that had a Hank antenna. I know that. So. Well, could have been. Could have been. It was sort of made for the the children toy market. So, you know, you probably make it as cheap as you could. Yeah, I worked on one, but I just don't remember. Yeah, I don't know if you can, can you hear me now? I was having a little trouble with my microphone, I think. Yes. yes. I have a couple of the Arvins, one the, under the Arvin and the other in the Silverturn, and they work pretty well, like better than I expected for a four tube set. Well, when you say they work well, it's it's a point that they, they'll pick up your local stations. You know, nope. you're not going to go DXing with them. No, I wouldn't consider them DXing radios, but I have a station out of Bridgeton that's about like 35 miles away from me. And if I am really careful, because they're not very selective, and I got some stronger stations adjacent to that, I can I can pull them in. I mean, you wouldn't win any DXing contest, but the better that I wouldn't expect them. I wasn't expecting to get that station at all. Are they pretty directional? I get to turn it in a certain way. No, uh, the long oh. wire. No, it's no, it long wire. Pretty, okay, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. And one bit of trivia on the hundred billiant tubes: if you swap them out as a complete set, or their the equivalents with the hundred fifty milliamp tubes, they'll work just fine in in any AA five radio. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've actually done that, and I'm probably going to do that in some sets that have printed circuit boards just to cut down on the heat. Mm. I did that in the GE as an experiment, and it works. It's perfectly happy with the it, with the 18 volt 150 milliamp tubes because the current's different. They got to be done as a complete set. Where and would you even find them these days? I was going to say, can you find the tubes? Here's mine. I've, I, I got a, a good stash. There was, uh, before the, the ESRC, it was in Florida, before the, the owner had passed away, he was selling several of the, the tubes, a dollar a tube. And I've, I've found them occasionally on Kutztown. And they show up on eBay too, pretty, pretty commonly. And the interesting thing with the rectifiers, there's some question about whether or not you can run a pilot light off the 100 milliamp tubes. One of the two manuals says it was just designed for current limiting and not meant to run a pilot light. But I actually found, did it briefly, I didn't test how long it will last, but you could actually run a pilot light off of them. Now, if you give me one second, I'll grab the box. I can tell you what, what number bulb I had to use to get it to work. So I'll be right back, I'll grab the box. Hey Al. Yeah. Got a question. Thinking back on the uh, you know the tap filament with a pilot light. By putting the pilot light across one half of that uh, rectifier tube filament, what does that do to the current across the filament? Well, it, it cuts it cuts it down. So but half the filament's working at fifty mils or whatever. Well, yeah, or, or yeah, seventy. Let's call it five, you know. But but then they make up for it by drawing, uh, by drawing B plus current through it. Right. And and see the problem is, if you just tried to put, you could have a, 150 mil pilot light. You try putting that in series with the heater string directly. When you turn the power on, yep. the yep. 18... everything low resistance, and the the pilot light heats up quicker and burns out before the the other tubes come up. So you okay. gotta you gotta protect it somehow. <laughs> All right, so if it's a hundred and fifty milliamp string, if the pilot light burns out, 
how does that contribute to shortening the life of the rectifier tube? Well, now you're now you're not only drawing the 150 oh, the volts plus. liter power, but you're you're drawing B plus through it. Ah, eh, still not. I got it. That's yeah. like a dim bulb tester, permanent. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Dim bulb. What are you trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's also the fuse too, isn't it? In most of those radios, if you get a B plus short, you you pop the 35W4. <laughs> Well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> oh, you got one M? Yeah, it's just my Arvin. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Metal uh, case. Another four tuber, right? Yeah, back to it. You know. Did they make any radios that weren't discount and small and? Works great. Like, did they make a? It just seems like Arvin always made tiny little cut rate sets. Did they make? more deluxe versions i have a tabletop am fm stereo arvin from the uh, 60s huh. and that actually has a mix of 100 and 150 milliamp tubes in the same circuit huh. Is that the one that looks like the dashboard of a car with the separate speaker that goes with it well this one has all the speakers built in into the what in the cabinet Oh, because they oh, they also made hi-fi amplifiers that look like they made some weird stuff in the late. It's pretty pretty far out stuff they made in the late fifties, Arvin. That they looked like radio. They looked like these tabletop things that had the thing on top looked like the windshield and a dashboard of a car almost. And hmm. uh, pretty cool looking things. This is an Arvin that's uh, five tube and it's really nice looking. So I guess they made nice. <laughs> all nice. kinds of radio. Yeah. That's a nice radio. Yeah, it's nice yeah I have that too. Radio. It's all it's transistor. It's a ten transistor Arvin. This thing is like a little DX machine. Let's see if I can get it turned on here. It's making up computer noise. This is my favorite <laughs> thing. It's got a dial light. Arvin used to make electric heaters and appliances too. Are they are they still in business as an auto parts manufacturer? Yeah, they yeah uh, mufflers, tailpipes, radiators. Yeah, they're they they don't make radios anymore. I think they're Arvin Meritor or something. They have their name is. You know. Funny thing about the eighteen volt tubes. These came up several years ago on the tube on the TCA reflector, um, and Ludwell Sibley pointed out that. That, that what they all end in the letter A, F A eighteen F X six A or whatever they are, because the the original version of the of the eighteen volt tubes did not have a um, controlled warm up heater for its series string. Well, as Blood pointed out, what the hell else were you going to use them for? <laughs> so they had to they they came out with the revision with the A suffix to to point out that they had the controlled uh, warm up characteristic. That was interesting. I've encountered 35 Z5s with an, with the where the um, the pilot light tap doesn't work. The tube still functions, but the pilot light tap doesn't work anymore. I've hmm. seen that, and I've always assumed that was from somebody using them with the wrong bulb or something. Bulb. Or well, they let the bulb burn out, and they never replaced it, and eventually yeah. burned out the tap. So I have the box. If you ever want to try to experiment and, and try the the hundred milliamp tubes in the set with a pilot light, you got to swap out the bulb for number eighteen fifty. And I've tried it in a in a Zenith uh, R five eleven, and it, it behaved it worked normally and the light ran the pilot light just fine, but you got to use that eighteen fifty bulb. What's the voltage of the eighteen fifty, Joe? I'd have to look up the specs. On it, I think it's it's about the same voltage, but it's a different current. Hold on, I'll okay. give me one second. I'll ask for Google, and I'll, I'll get that for you. I got a bold manual. Yeah, Darren's getting it. Let's see if we can find it first. <laughs> Is this like John Henry in the five volt point oh nine amp or point four five watt? Say it again. It's a five volt, uh, 0.45 watt, or 0.09 amp. Wasn't a 47 a 6.3 volt? Yeah. What's the what's yeah. 18? What's the number? 18 what? 
1850. What? 1850. Yeah, Joe just had it, Darren. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I don't know if you can see it there. 1850 is the uh... signal. Five volts, 0.25. Oh, 0.09 amps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's good for 1500 hours. So I've seen the, that rectifier and pilot lab circuit actually act as a fuse on I had a, a Delco where the output tube started to develop gas and was drawing too much current. And I was actually watching the pilot light get brighter and brighter. And before I could get over to it, the pilot light burned out. Fortunately, I got to it before the, it took out the rectifier also. So I don't think that was their intention, but it definitely does act kind of like a fuse. Yeah, if your pilot light's real bright, it's a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Al, for your uh, your talk tonight. I'm going to call it a night. Okay, you're most welcome, Paul. Thank, thanks for the comment. Okay. Yeah, it was very revealing, and I thought I knew some of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, I, I thought, I, well, I hadn't paid much attention. I figured it was time to, to figure out what happened. <laughs> very interesting. Always learn something here. Yes, it was very good, Alan. Thank and, you. And like I said, it really, nice. it really is an engineering masterpiece. I mean, yeah. you know, what else? I never, you I never thought I would hear you use masterpiece and AA5 in the same sentence, Al. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, but if you think about it, what the radio could do and what it cost, it really is a, it's an amazing thing. Yeah, you got to build me a radio for nobody, but it's got to work. Oh, shit, you know. And they really <laughs> do. Yeah. Thanks, Al. You refreshed my memory also and stuff. And, it, and it's amazing that day and age that we live in because I was able to, you know, listen to Al's wonderful presentation while working on an AA5. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's like recursive, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the other part of it is, you can listen to that talk and actually understand what's going on. And then you look at your phone and you say, yeah, <laughs> yeah there's, 10, there's 10 million transistors there. And you don't no, know, what no. there's approximately 1 billion. No, oh, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Equivalents. Well, maybe on John's phone is 10 million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's only an iPhone seven. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. Anyway, I didn't realize that the bulb getting bright thing was normal, and I just assumed it had something I still had to fix, like a cap or something. So that makes me feel better knowing yeah, that no, little like small said, piece. They they come up and then they dim down and then they drift back to the right, the right brightness. I didn't I didn't really know that. I I I looked at that and then I went and looked looked at one of our radios. Yeah, sure enough, they do that. <laughs> But thanks again, Al. Appreciate it. Oh, well, uh, my, my pleasure. Yeah. All right. All right, guys. Very entertaining. Thank uh, you. Just before 10 o'clock, let's uh, officially end the meeting. And uh, if anybody wants to stick around, stick around. And uh, like I said at the beginning of the meeting, if you'd like to talk about uh, our unfortunate anniversary today, if you want to talk about where you were, what you remember, we can certainly do that. And if you don't want to talk about it, don't talk about it. But uh, Actually, next year, it's uh, 20 years. And uh, yeah. at least for me, it seems like yesterday. Before the story start, I wanted to ask a question. Did we lose any members then? My, uh, within my union, uh, IBEW Local Union Number 3 in New York City, we lost 18 members. I mean, of the NJRC. I don't believe so. Not okay. as far as we know, no. Okay. I was in Manhattan at the time, and I saw the planes go in buildings. That's, yeah. So Where yeah. were you, Owen? Oh. I was in downtown Manhattan. I was working there that 
morning, and you know, I saw it. I saw that whole thing happen. The Wall Street area? Up beyond, more like Spring Street. Okay. Up there. Had a good view, but it's, uh, it's, I was there for the whole day almost, trying to get home. Sure, yeah. I had a, I had a friend that worked for Channel 13, and about a week before that, he was fired by Bill Baker. So he wrote Bill Baker an email saying he, he saved his life. Yeah, that's one way of looking at it, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to put up a, a picture here. Let's see if this works. Uh, and it did not work. I okay, well, I, I need to bail, gentlemen. So, okay. so thank you for your attention. Thank you for your Thank time. you, Al. Thank, thank you for you. your presentation, Al. Al, excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you, for the thank you, thank you Al. Al. Yeah. Very good. Excellent, Al. Al. Thank you much. Great. I was going to put up a picture of the club's uh, web page. I don't know if anybody ever noticed, but if you scroll, I should hope they'd notice that. That's, that's the, the wonderful thing you've had up for 19 years. That's been years. there forever. All the all way the to the, the bottom of the home page. Yeah. I was working. I was working at the World Trade Center on September first, two thousand one, and I took that photograph. And uh, I have never been back since then. I just uh, just can't do it. I I could tell you. A couple of things. Some of them are even radio related. Um, I remember when that happened and I was at work and I work in Staten Island at the uh, right on the right on the water in Staten Island up high on a hill. Um, and um, I was in my shop and a, um, a, a, a teacher came in with a box fan, you know, a cheap box fan like they sell in Kmart for 15 bucks or whatever it was before we had air conditioning in, in a lot of the rooms and someone somehow the plug got caught in the door somehow the, the plug had gotten trampled and um, she asked me if I could put a new plug on her box fan and yeah okay leave it here so oh by the way she said did you hear a plane hit the World Trade Center and I said no I said but that's interesting. And she went about her business and I, I went in my office and I, uh, in the back of the shop and I took a transistor radio and I, I, it's floating around somewhere. It's one of those GEs, the, the GE with the, the large GE transistor with the round, uh, the round dial, the gold speaker grill and used to use the big nine volt battery and I converted it. Anyhow, oh. I always had it at work. I listened to it a lot. And I took that transistor radio and a, and a 35 millimeter camera and I get on the elevator and I take it up to the fourth floor or fifth floor. And I, uh, I go, and as I get off the elevator, there are six people waiting to walk out onto the roof to see, because apparently they had heard and the radio is giving the stock report. So I unlock the door to go out onto the roof. I walk out onto the roof and the first plane had already hit and, uh, as we're walking out, they cut in on, I think it was um, 880 or what they, unconfirmed reports that a plane had hit the World Trade Center. And um, a short while later, we're all out there watching, listening to the radio, trying to figure out uh, what had happened. And the second plane came roaring in, oh, right between our, the school building and, a, and, a, uh, and another school down the road. And it just came roaring in basically over our heads and quicker than we could figure out what was going on. It hit the, uh, it hit the second tower and that's when everybody knew um, the school wound up as a shelter, a whole nine yards. But interestingly enough, um, they lost, um, they lost cable television almost immediately and we were watching a, I had a, a um, used to have at that time, a, a, one of those 21 inch, all the schools used to have these black and white TVs from years ago. They had that they were video monitor GE TV. And I had had one in the shop that it was just in the shop. I used to watch the news on it and stuff. And that thing was, it had an antenna and we rolled it out and, People were watching, were watching this black and white TV until the stations went off. And I think we obviously were able to get the, the um, what is it, nine that was transmitting out of, out of uh, New Jersey. But uh, 
That was a and two. That was a crazy day, though. And uh, it was, yeah. I, I remember. Yeah, I saw that plane go in. I saw that plane. Go in. Every year since then, um, at that time, every more uh, in the morning on the September 11th, I go up to the roof, and there used to be uh, a number of us that would meet up there. And as time has gone on, um, I'm kind of the last one left there that would that's been there since that happened because I everybody's either retired or moved on but uh, it's uh, it's kind of kind of weird Darren then you heard is I was on the Staten Island Ferry uh -huh. so the the plane passed overhead you you heard then the engines go up and down in speed yeah as he tried to control the plane yeah mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the thing that got me uh, is is that we were still very close to Staten Island when the second plane hit, and uh, I I remember the plane, you know I looked up just as the plane was hitting the building and, and saw the the uh, of course the shredding of the plane and the explosion, and um, what what really caught me is here I am five miles away from the building. And five seconds later, this huge heat wave passes me on the outside of the Staten Island Ferry. And that's when I knew nobody was getting out. Nobody was going to get out of that building. We, 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 uh, were, uh, we were watching the whole thing. And, and we were kind of – now, the other part of this is a gentleman – one of the gentlemen who was standing with me was standing there on the roof. Um, he was a uh, – he, he, he had a, he was an architecture course at the school. And at the time, he was in his 50s. And, you know, he immediately said to us, watching the building burn, he said, they have to get that fire out. And we looked at him, and he said, I, he said, when I was starting out, he said, I worked for the firm that designed those buildings. And he started explaining to us what was going to happen in detail uh, if they did not get the fire out. And he, it, it, as he described it is, is exactly how those buildings went down. Because he said what was going to happen, and and uh, he said you know that if if there's enough fuel on those planes, I mean, I guess you know he was intimately familiar with the, the the superstructure that those buildings, and and he knew immediately he said that that they have to get the fire out, which was well, the strength of the trade center, the, the, those buildings, you know, they were built to sway in the wind. Yeah. So the strength really was in those steel fingers on the outside. Yeah. But they were never made to, to be whacked by anything bigger than a 707. Well, the, the right. other problem is, the other problem is when you spread heat out over a, an area of a, of a metal bar, you, you deal with so much distortion that it, it's really no wonder what happens when things start to pull away and stop. Well, I was actually working on some projects for a company that did the uh, fireproofing coatings for the steel girders in the buildings at the time. And they said, you know, there's, there's design limits to everything. And that was just so far outside of the design limits of anything that anybody had anticipated that there was no, no possibility of, uh, of that building uh, surviving that. Well, I, I think with, the, uh, with reference to the fireproofing coating, um, from what I understand, and this actually makes sense, it, when you soak it with flammable liquid, what you do is you create a, a, a wick, you basically create a mantle for the, for the burning fuel to store and burn. So I, I think, you know, much like a, like a lantern mantle, I think that, that that stuff actually made that worse because it was designed to be fire resistive, not to be saturated with, uh, you know, slow burning kerosene. And it was uh, designed to be fire resistant to the types of fires you might ordinarily expect to find in a building like that. Yeah, yeah, yep. But don't, don't forget also that in, uh, uh, I think it was April of 1944, a B-29 hit the north side of the Empire State Building. Um, B-25. A life lost and all, and so I believe it was the 79th floor. And um, it didn't collapse, it didn't, uh, well, it was certainly a fire. A uh, different animal, but, you know, a different means of construction of that era. That was a, that was a compartmentized building with steel, uh, with masonry uh, surrounded steel. Uh, masonry is a little 
a little better. I, the masonry, it's a different, different animal. And I'm going to guess, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm going to guess that the bomber was probably not carrying the volume of fuel that the, uh, you know, the, those bastards, they, they, they picked those planes because of the volume of fuel they were carrying. There's no two ways. You know, they, they know that they did that. But, um, yeah, yeah, the, 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 the plane that hit the, the, em the Empire State Building, he was lost. He, he, he was miles away from the airfield he was trying to land at. So yes, you're right. He did not have a full, uh, you know, load of fuel with him. And it was, it's a much, much, much smaller plane. Yeah, I don't think it could carry that much fuel. It's a B-25, which is a light, yeah. you know, a medium bomber, two engine bomber. Yeah. No, that, that, the, um, the, those, those, those jumbo jets, those things were, those, one of them I think was loaded with fuel to go to California. And I think the other one was, was headed somewhere to Europe or something. Kind of planes were they? I don't remember. One was the seven forty seven four seven, I think. Really? They may both have Jesus. been. Actually. No, I don't think they were. I thought they were like seven thirty sevens or something. No, they, I think they were seven six sevens. They were big yeah. international. Uh, yeah, they were. They were big, big international. The seven six sevens, I think they were. were yeah, they weren't. They weren't yeah, they weren't four engine planes. No, they weren't jumbo jets. No. Yeah, they were. They were wide body jumbo jets. I don't. They they carefully selected those planes and those flights for maximum maximum fuel content, maximum. They they like I said, those bastards did their homework, and and they were out to kill, maximum damage. That's what they wanted. Yeah. Well, the other the go other. Go bigger, go home. What's that? Hey, you go bigger, go home. You're yeah, gonna well, you're gonna do this thing. You get one chance. You're not gonna. The other side of this is. The day before this happened, uh, September 10th, 2001, I went to drive a friend to Newark Airport. And I drove up to the, the uh, you know, where, you, where the taxis and where you can drop people off. I don't even know. I haven't been to Newark Airport in years. I don't even know anymore. But uh, <clears throat> I drove up to the, where you drop any gets out of the truck and I, said goodbye and I went to drive away and I noticed that he left his, his, his I don't know, his wallet or his keys, keys. He left his keys on the center console of the truck. So I said, okay, so now I have to, of course, this before, before met most people, before, you know, common people had cell phones. So I, I had to park and I took the keys and I walked into the airport and they were having problems with the the, the, the belt, the, uh, the x-ray machine belt to get out to the terminal. Back then, you could walk, anyone could go to the end of the terminal. You just had to go through the metal detector and the x-ray machine. So they're having problems, and it's backing up the line. And so they're waving people through the service gate around the x-ray machine <laughs> to get out to the terminal. So I walk through this, and I'm shaking my head, and I'm saying, this is not going to end well. And I remember saying that. The boy, this is not good. This is not going to end well. I remember thinking. It, it, uh, yeah. On a personal note, it wasn't uh, so involved in the uh, trade center, but at the time, my uh, my mom was in a hospital in Flushing. Uh, anybody knows Queens, the Booth Memorial Hospital, and she was uh, in for a lymphoma. She was going to undergo a first treatment of a new uh, chemotherapy, and it was scheduled for the eleventh. And um, this happened, so I canceled that. And I was actually able to get into the uh, hospital on the 12th. And I got in there to see her. And, you know, she was, you know, bordering on consciousness. And I just think of seeing this and not maybe fully comprehending what happened. And uh, I saw her that day, the 12th, and that's the day she went into a coma. And she lasted about two weeks. I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, what went on her mind that she sees this and really didn't know what happened. And for the w couple of weeks I went to see her in the ICU, she was in the front, she had a front view on Main Street in Flushing. And you could see in the distance for weeks when I went there, the smoke coming up from downtown Manhattan. <clears throat> Every day I saw that. Wow. Was, that was eerie. Every day I worked there, I smelled it. You'd smell it all over Manhattan. And I was still at uh, 52nd Street. Yeah, I, I went in about two weeks, two or three weeks later, I went in, I took a lot of pictures. Uh, Everything was still, you know, covered in white dust. Uh, 
they had the um, side of the building, uh, 195 Broadway, which is a, it used to be an AT&T building. They had a walkway along that. You could walk up the walkway and look at the uh, ground zero. And right next to it was, uh, I think it's old St. Paul's, the, the church. And they had a graveyard. And it looked like snow in the graveyard. It was all, you know, white powder. And looking back, you wonder, you know, what was that white powder made of? Best all the stuff that killed the firefighters. Yeah. Human, human remains. Asbestos, human remains. PCBs. Well, probably the drywall ground up. Right. I knew someone who worked in that that the, uh, the Bell Telephone building next to the Trade Center. What is it? Uh, West that was at one time their New York headquarters, I think. Oh, the one that has no windows? No, it's a big, beautiful. That's a PBX. No, this was, look, this was Darren, a big. Darren, it's at uh, West Street and Vesey Street. Wait, he, he worked there. And, West and, easy, yeah. And he was telling me that, uh, and this was five years ago I spoke to him about this. He said they were still finding every time they would do work on the bill. First of all, he said one of the engines from one of the planes actually landed on that building. And yeah. that, the, hmm. there's an old phone company buildings, you know, that the, the, they, they were built to withstand nuclear wars. And, you know, a lot of debris pieces of the Trade Center landed on that building. The only damage that the phone company building um, suffered, and it was unfortunate because apparently a lot of the Bell Telephone archives were in the basement of that building. And of course, from all the firefighting in the water, water, yeah, flooded out the basement of the, of the phone company building. But he said uh, up until five years ago, and probably still now, every time they would do work on the facade of that building or the roof of that building, they were finding either pieces of the trade center, uh, human remains, all kinds of things. He said they constantly would find on that phone company building. Because it was literally the shadow of the... I, I saw it. Well, a, a good friend of mine, his son was with uh, one of the interconnect companies and he was considered essential during the recovery. And he uh, showed me a picture he had taken of a fire engine sitting on its front bumper vertically under the street because the, the telephone company building was erected in the time of copper under the street is hollow. Yeah, copper vaults, the vaults the vaults under there. Yeah, so it was cable vaults. You know, for copper cabling to be brought in on several levels under the building. Mm -hmm. And as the the one building fell, it broke up the street and the fire engine actually pitched forward and was sitting on its front bumper intact. Uh, you know, several layers below the street. I should have been in the restaurant that day. I should have been in the windows of the world. Uh, there was a, a, a con pardon me. There, there was a, a, a meeting for people who had been laid off from the securities industry. And I had worked with a number of people who were there. And they had asked me to come to pick up resumes to critique resumes and, and bring them to my then employer and, and, and so on and so forth. And I had worked real late Monday night. I got home, it was like 2.30 in the morning uh, on Tuesday, and I was going to have to work late Tuesday night. So I just blew off, you know, going to this brunch. Um, I felt bad about it. And then I was on the ferry, like I say, to see the second plane hit. And that's when I realized, you know, those, those buildings were gone. Uh, right. it, was, it was just uh, Did they turn the boat around? Was, was, uh, did well, they yes, turn? They did. Well, yeah. Yeah. They, they brought it back to Staten Island, yes. <laughs> yes. Because I know that they were using the, uh, they, <clears throat> they were using that, the boats to bring um, this place. Yeah, yeah. They wanted to get people out of Manhattan yeah. there, out of, out of that whole downtown Manhattan area. And oh, they sure. were just loading them on the ferry boats and pushing them off to Staten Island because I know they were coming, wandering up to the school, lost, dazed, confused, covered in, in, in debris yeah. and uh, everything else. Yeah. And everybody running towards their family or loved ones or coworkers. Yeah, they, it became like Dunkirk and uh, all boats were... Uh, uh, down to by the battery and uh, yep. especially yep. on the East River also a lot of people exited from the, uh, the East every, River because you get out easier that way 
obviously uh, everything else on the west side was uh, under uh, under smoke and debris. Anything that, as I recall, anything that would float was being loaded with people, whether whether they were fishing boats, yeah, the boat lift. cargo boats, water boats, tug boats. They were just putting people on onto these boats. And then and bring them to Jersey City, and you fend for yourself from there. Jersey City, Staten Island, <laughs> and, and we had these people, and it was it was something because, first of all, we lost our main phone service, but we had a couple of, of uh, lines that we didn't lose, so <clears throat> we we had to put calls. With I had to go into the main terminal uh, in the building where all the copper comes in, because back then everything we had was copper. And I had to go into that terminal, and basically I just put three, um, three 2,500 desk phones on a table so that there could be communication for the people who were trying to call their loved ones and stuff. And I, I line identified the three lines, which you can still do, I think. Yeah, it still works in New York or New Jersey. And we figured out what the <clears throat> what the numbers for them were so that we could have incoming and we basically worked off three phones and we even had several families that had to make international calls and good luck trying to get an international operator that day it was it was it was it was everything about it was 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 something out of a bad dream really well wait so did any of you guys have to do anything from like a ham perspective like that seems like the that would have been the you know the time the field day thing right that you've been preparing for. Did was there anything about that? Yeah, there was. Uh, I remember seeing it on a QST. Uh, I can't uh, remember exactly what it was, but uh, people did set up for for emergencies because, like I said, cell phone system was down, and that's why down yeah. back then was very much against uh, cell phones because they did go down. And right. uh, there was you know there was just a general panic all around. Uh, people were thinking that uh, the next thing uh, going to be blown up with the bridges and tunnels. Right. And uh, they shut down uh, bridges and tunnels, all traffic. So I was, um, I was stuck in town. Um, you know, obviously you want to leave. I was at 54th, 52nd street. I had my, my car on the east side, which was better. And I ended up going uh, north, uh, staying away from the, any of the east side drive. And it was a very eerie sight was to see I was actually getting out fairly easily uh, in my car, but uh, everybody was walking north very quietly. Everybody, nobody speaking. They were just all walking north, all right. north, 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 right through Harlem, all the way up to the GW Bridge. And I figured I'd, I'd have to go further north. I'd have to go over uh, maybe the Beacon Bridge uh, all, all the way up. Um, but uh, at that moment, around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they opened up the GW Bridge. And uh, it was just very, very, very eerie. I remember when I left work, now I left the school at about six o'clock in, in the evening because the first thing, it, it was one thing after another. I had just bought a, 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 a brand, a, a new pickup truck. And the, one of the, the, you know, they had all these people showing up, so they needed to feed them. So they actually had solicited donate. They had called up re all the restaurants and everybody. They were sending <clears throat> food. They were offering food you know, for the, for the shelter. So I took the truck and, and I took one of the, one of the teachers who had called up all the, she had a list of all the different, when we went and I came back and I had the whole bed of the truck full of food and we offloaded all the food. And uh, I went out again and I did a second trip uh, and we picked up all the food. And the only thing that we neglected to get was coffee. Did they so, lock the kids in Darren? No, they sent the kids home. They sent the kids home. Um, and actually th what they did, uh, they allowed them to leave. And a lot of the parents actually came to pick the kids up or they or they left, they went home. Um, but we did not, they did not want the kids in the school because the school was going to be used to house, um, you know, people, displaced people. Was schools uh, closed for a while? couple of days yeah it was closed and i was in the next day but it was closed the next right, day. i meant for teaching I, or yeah. for kids or whatever and and they did not require the staff to come in though most of us did um and i went in the next day i you know restored phone service and you know worked with them on that and um 
that kind of stuff. They lost at that time. They had just gotten T1 internet service. They lost that. Um, they were running, and actually the next day they were running modems to get people onto um, <clears throat> to get people online so that they could contact loved ones through email and stuff. And like I said back then, I didn't have a cell phone, and a lot most people. Some people had them, but they were still expensive, and not a lot of people had them back then. Aaron, most people had them back then. Yeah, because I had not, a cell phone not, back then. I was in high school. Them. Not the people. <laughs> well, some people did, but a lot of the people I worked with didn't have them. Um, I think I after that, everybody I work with had them. Had a track mine, phone. Mine was bolted into Ooh, my car. I didn't need a track phone. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Now on a on a sidebar, a radio related. Uh, you know, the weeks after, probably maybe six to eight weeks after, um, towers down, all the radio stations, not all, but most radio stations and all TV stations were gone. Right. They, they hightailed it up to where? Um, Alpine. Armstrong Tower, yeah. That's right. And I remember when that happened, <clears throat> we did have cable. Because um, I lived in Staten Island at the time. We had cable, but the cable company was... At that point, they were being, they wouldn't let you, you had to have a box on every television to, to utilize the cable. So we had a few TVs in the house. So we had cable on one set and we had a big, and I had an antenna on the roof for the other sets. And it was just, it was not that big an antenna because you didn't need a tremendous antenna. But um, I had to replace it and I had to get one of those big super Colortron deep fringe antennas because you could not get Armstrong Tower. Right, Staten Island with a with a with a you know medium range antenna, and I wound up putting that with a rotor because for a while we were able to you know we would watch we're always able to get Philadelphia, um, you know. But when that when the tower was down, we were getting Hartford too. Hmm. I remember um, two. I remember two things that I had almost forgotten about. The uh, the first one was a. A, a couple of days, maybe a week or two after this all happened, I got a phone call that really got my attention. It was the FBI was calling me. And uh, I don't get a lot of phone calls from the FBI. You don't? Um, no. So they, yeah, it kind of caught my attention. So I called them right back and um, they actually had some sort of a tape. They were looking for somebody that could play a beta cam tape because they had some sort of a tape that they thought was a clue or something. And they were looking for a place to, uh, to play it. The FBI didn't have any beta cam machines. So I did, and they were going to come and play it. But apparently they, f they found somebody in Manhattan that could do it. But, you know, it was, uh, it was just kind of a weird thing to get a phone call from the, uh, from the FBI. The, the other thing that, that uh, was interesting is that I was doing a lot of work with uh, BOC gases at the time. And the, uh, the fellow that I was working with, I really, I really think very highly of him and how, how quickly he thought uh, by the afternoon of September 11th, he had two uh, trailers full of liquid oxygen racing up the uh, Jersey Turnpike with a state police escort to get to the, uh, the ground zero because he knew they were going to need cutting torch oxygen for cutting torches there. And, um, you know, I, I really uh, I, I just thought that that was uh, some really quick thinking on his part. A, there was a lot of very, very minor, very hidden heroes that day. For several months after that happened, we had big problems getting oxygen and acetylene. You, it, it was in short supply because there was such a demand for it there that you basically were put on an as-needed waiting list that if you ordered it, you were getting your delivery within two weeks. Yep. So, I mean, they, they, and when I left, that's what the other thing I was going to When I left the, the school building that day, I drove down Bay Street um, and queued up on Bay Street for about almost to Highland Boulevard, which is about four or five miles, uh, were fire trucks from as far south as Richmond, Virginia. And they were, you know, they were using the ferry boats to bring them. But uh, yeah, that was, yeah. How long did they, did they lock down New York after, you know, like on the 12th or whatever? Like certain, certain areas, certain neighborhoods below 23rd Street was locked down for months. I was going to say, I, I kind of figured they'd have to just try to keep like gawkers and stuff out of, off the bridges and stuff. Well, um, something else uh, people forget, and I guess I'm old enough because I do remember. I happened to be on uh, Water Street on, 
I think it was February 26, 1993. And that was oh. the bombing, the original bombing <laughs> yeah. of the Trade Center. And uh, I felt that, that I felt, I was close enough to it to feel it. And, uh, you know, that was a, uh, the prelude, the prelude where uh, the, uh, what was his uh, name, the one-eyed... Uh, she? Uh, something. Bond, something. Some? Brian, was it don't some? worry, hey. it's going to happen. Yeah. Don't worry, my people will take care of it. Mm. Just wait and see. I, I remember when that happened, and I remember I was at home, and I had the, the radio on. And all of a sudden, the radio station went off the air. And that was, uh, I think that's how we knew. Something happened. They cut the, the radio stations that were on the Trade Center went off real quick. Mm. And that happened. I don't know if they lost power or something happened. But it didn't last long. But this, the radio station went off. I didn't notice that. I, I know it was strange, though, for months afterwards, if you took the train into Manhattan, you'd uh, come out uh, up at a Penn Station and right. uh, there'd be a line of, line of guys with automatic weapons standing there. That was kind of eerie. Still are. <laughs> you know, the, the yeah. sad thing is I barely remember that day anymore. All I remember is watching the news. I remember being in gym class. And one thing I do remember it struck out is I was still in high school, right? I was doing homework and then you write your homework, you write your name at the top and you write the date, right? And you write it out then you know, nine eleven and I remember seeing that and say, I wonder if this is on purpose. You know, I, I don't think at the time they had said why it happened, right? You know, they just said what had happened but not how or you know, whatever. And I remember that and I remember later in the day they would say what it actually was, you know, but I remember writing down 911 and remember thinking that was a hell of a weird coincidence and then obviously it probably wasn't. I just realized that millennials, so many people uh, do not remember, they don't know anything about it, you know, other than what we tell them about it. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If, if, if you're not from New York, I'm like, no, no, but I knew I even was ever in this city. No one had been out of Ohio, you know, what? so it's sad, but it's no different than watching war footage of another country, you know, when you've never been there and you can't, when you don't know anybody that's ever been there, when you don't know anybody that knows anybody that's ever been there, it's yeah. a lot different. I remember when I first came out here, we went out to eat on September 11th and I didn't, you know, I didn't intentionally do it, but I just remembered how weird it was. It was like, so no one was talking, it was quiet. And I'm like looking at the calendar and it's like, oh, right. You know, that's not that far from here. And that means people remember this and that means they know people. And it was just a, you know, I was alive when it happened, but it didn't impact me like it impacted you. So to see it, to just to have that realization brought to your attention was an interesting feeling. Well, yeah, I, I could tell you when, when a couple of guys you went to high school with and a girl from church and, uh, you know, and, and these are all people that you knew, maybe not closely, when they went down in that, I mean, it, you, yeah, it, it, you look at it, I'm sure, very, very differently. I, right. uh, I, I've, I've for, for, uh, for whatever now, for what, 18 years, I, I, I try to catch all the names on the, on the morning, on the, on the broadcast, I just feel... Something, something that uh, you know needs to be done. What I, I, I have uh, always felt, and again, this is just an opinion. Having seen this, you know, in front of me, um, was one thing. But I think if you saw it on television, you knew what was happening, and it was bad enough. But I think that seeing it in person. Seeing it in front of you, and I wasn't even there. I was seeing it, you know, I dare I say from a safe, quote-unquote, safe distance. But, you know, for the people who were standing there when this happened, I, I think there's a big difference between well, seeing something in person and seeing it on a television. Yeah, I don't think well, that's an assumption. I think it's just kind of a given. I wasn't close to it at all, but, you know, Darren, I, when I worked in Clark, I could, I could go to work for, it seemed like months. It was probably a week or so. I could just look out the window and see these plumes of smoke coming up and mm -hmm. wafting off over Manhattan. It's almost a month, I think, that you would see that. Yeah, I mean, that was, uh, yeah. gets your attention. Yeah. But it would have impacted every single one of you. You know, you guys would remember the smell. You would remember seeing the plume. You would remember not seeing airplanes because most of you live under one of the three or four or five airplanes flight paths. You know, I would never have noticed the planes weren't flying because they weren't anywhere near my house. 
to begin with, you know, so it's a, it would have been a huge change for you guys that we would never have noticed other than I'm on the TV. Well, talking of change, right? Think about it's 19 years later. What has changed in our lives that we just take for granted from that day? <laughs> Freedom. I'll, I'll start with one thing, and uh, maybe you guys don't realize it because you don't travel the roads like I do. But on the GW Bridge, you know, it's it's a upper and level lower level, and uh, as soon as uh, probably the, the following day or the following week at least. Uh, trucks were not allowed on the bottom level of the bridge, thinking that a tractor trailer with explosives would blow the hell out of the GW bridge. But to this day, you cannot take a trailer, truck trailer uh, yeah. on, the, on the lower level. It has to be on the top level. Any of, the, any of those people take for granted, but that was because of that. Any of those bridges, and, I've been, and I, I did something, I had to take it shortly the next year or whatever it was, I had to take a truck into uh, New York City to, to bring stuff for the school and I and at that point you would get pulled over and I think you still do randomly pulling trucks over before they go into the tunnels to go in or out of the city to do inspections especially rental trucks yeah and they, you know that never used to happen but they do that now and uh, they put a lot of restrictions I think on what can what can and can't go into the city yeah. and I think also um, people in small uh, people are not allowed to fly Manhattan is almost a completely no fly zone now, I think, right? There was a baseball yeah. player who managed to. Yeah, he drop. got lost. Yeah. yeah, he got lost and hit the Empire State Building. Not that yeah. far, long after that. No, you know what? what happened? He was, he was flying a small single engine airplane. Yeah, he yeah, a little. He didn't realize how strong the wind was. So his turn over the East River was three times or four times larger than he thought. And he hit a building on the east side because like I said, he, he couldn't make his turn because the wind kept blowing him further and further. So uh, um, that that's, uh, I forget that baseball. Yeah, John, it was an apartment house, yeah. Hey Rich? Yeah, yeah. Hey Rich? Yeah, Bill. No. Uh, you, you mentioned the GW Bridge. Do you remember the huge flag they had hanging from the bridge after that happened? Yes. The biggest flag I've ever they, seen. They had that, um, I think they still do it on July 4th. Okay. Yeah. It was huge. And another One of the other... is, what, what about the airports? I don't That's... believe until after 9-11 did they, they, with this, the shoes taken off and all that. Yeah, that's right. Well, I was, I was yeah. going to say, the, what we have is, excuse me for being cynical, but we have all this utterly useless uh, security theater now at the airports. Yeah. Yeah, it is theater for sure. Well, travel, they, the Travel Suppression Agency. If I'm not mistaken, that's when all the addresses had to be. That's when they started changing addresses in the country, right? Isn't that when they got rid of all the route and box numbers that when they went to all the locations addresses? I don't think it has anything to do with it. Yeah, I think I think it was part of some security measure and bill that was passed that they eliminated all the all the they started eliminating them. I think I think mine was changed a year or two before I bought the house because I was still getting mail to the old address for quite a while. Do you mean the post office box numbers? I think now, you're talking about like the rural routes. Yeah, That's yeah. Long areas, gone. What's that? It wasn't but 2011. We were they were gone before I was even born where I live because my no was no 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 too. no no because no because this house was I mean a couple of years before I bought it, it was still Route Three Box 483, and because I was still getting mail to that address when I bought the house, but I I, I know it was I was told it had recently changed. But. I think they did away with them in the late 90s, early 2000s. I don't know if it was tied into that, but I thought it was. Well, we oh, still have name. that delivery down here. I don't at my house, but you know, the, you constantly see the, the, the vehicles with the sign post office on it, the blinking yellow lights and their stuff in mailboxes as they- Yeah, but John, do you yeah. have, do you have a physical address attached yeah. to those houses? Everyone That's has That's the to. question. Because, you know, I know where I am, I had a hell of a time setting up mail because this house never had a physical address. It was just a tax map number. 
Well, because it, it hadn't been lived in after they changed the addresses, I think. But don't they have, don't they have public roads that you live on? No. Yeah. But Down here, almost all the buildings have a five digit number. Yeah. But yeah, but no, no, where I am, you don't have public roads. You're okay. on roads, but it's not open to the public. However, you get into rural areas and, you know, they did not, the address was not the same. Your mailing address was different than your physical address. Yeah, they, they didn't have official, a lot of places didn't have a phys, official physical addresses. They had but, but Darren, numbers, Darren so. the address on this place, the yeah. physical address, did not change until you know about 2014. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that I don't that, think they're rele relevant to 9/11. I think there's just the timing. Maybe your area in the country. I mean, I, I lived out in the country, and it was a rural route too. But entire my entire lifespan, it had the same physical address as the mailing address. No, my my house has had three different addresses. Right, but you live on a private lot in private street so it's going to be different every every house in wayne county with the ex pennsylvania with the exception of if you're in a city area as in you know like honesdale or hawley where the houses are top on top of one another are attached all these places have had three different addresses in the last 10 years yeah I, the originals I, were changed because the feds changed the standard you had to have an address Every so many month or every so many, you know, feet, you had to have a different address. It, it was and then it no, was in let the me finish, Darren. Yeah. And then the fucking county screwed it up and they didn't understand the standards and assign new addresses, but they were all wrong, so they had to change them again. Well, if it was in twenty fourteen, it's obviously nothing to do with September eleventh. Well, I, I remember it being in the news and I don't remember what the trigger was. But basically, the federal government or the Postal Service mandated that every house had to have, and the term was, a locatable address. And this may have had more to do with GPS systems than anything else. But because let me, let me chime in on this, all right? Yeah. It goes, I'll tell you right now, it goes back to the, uh, actually, to the late 80s, early 90s. My address changed from 152 to 154. And the reason for it, they told me, had to do with the 911 uh, emergency coding, that all police stations, all municipalities would be on the same page with the uh, addresses. Uh, why they had to change it by two digits for me, I don't know. It's still a complication on my tax uh, returns, on my uh, tax uh, uh, maps, um, and uh, I, I, still, I still get mail for 152. In a way, I don't care, but maybe when I'm dead, it's going to be a problem. I don't know. I don't really I'm, care at the moment. I'm guessing that this that this took a while for them to do this, you know, throughout the whole country. I'm guessing it took years for them to implement this, but because I, I every once in a while I'll still get like advertising mail to the old address that with you know with the with, with without and then at 483 it'll say. You know, or routes or RD, I think it was RD was the uh, something like that. Well, like I said, one my old address is 152. Now it's 154. There is no 152 anymore. So yeah. you know, it drives people crazy if they're looking for an address. Well, the local post office people will also bridge the gap for some of this stuff. Um, I do have a physical house address, but I don't have postal service. I have a PO box. I have to go In a to a lot the of places. With my mail. All right, guys, I'm not going to pull the plug on this, but I'm going to end the session. Uh, we had a great meeting. We've got to thank Al again for uh, making things simple and understandable to us, you know. All right, so our next meeting will be October 9th, and that would be with uh, Mr. October. And that'll be our very own Mike Moldar. And he'll be talking about early FM. And, of course, that'll be a Zoom meeting. So, again, thanks for uh, showing up, and thanks for being part of our uh, our talk and uh, especially on 9-11. All right, so I'm gonna say good night, okay? But I'll leave you running, okay? Hey, well, thanks, Rich, good night. Thanks, All right, Rich. John, boy. All right, bye-bye. I have a question, Rich. Yeah. I, I, I was late 
you know, to tonight's meeting. So I, I, I guess I missed out on some information. YouTube. Since, since you're, since you're widescreen, where was I supposed to get the 3D glasses in order to look at your, your, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> you have to talk to, I, I, I you have to talk to that. Matt and you have to get into his DeLorean and go back to the future. Just, just okay. go I haven't 11. heard that joke since tomorrow. Just go to 7-Eleven. Isn't that where we used to go when they used to run the 3D movies on TV? You had to go to 7-Eleven to buy the, the glasses. Good night. Okay. Okay, Rich. <laughs> what is the cover on his camera? I swear it looks like a ghost. I know. It's weird. It's like a, a smiley face sideways. I, I think what it is, is the lens cap that has the Logitech logo on it. Oh, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. The little swirly star yeah. face. Yeah. Thing. yeah. I only say that because I used to have the same camera. Yeah, it looks like it, yeah. <laughs> I have a, I have a, you're right, it, I have a Logitech uh, wireless mouse here. Yeah, and that's what it looks yeah. yeah, let, let me you show you the good. Let me show you the camera. <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> Can't do that, can you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's very funny. Well, um, I guess the Logitech's not hurting for money. Well, you can't oh. buy the cameras. I, I had to buy this. I actually bought mine on eBay. Uh, it was like used, but like new in box. Uh, the price tripled since I bought you know, the other they, one about two years ago. They've become somewhat unavailable because I know the school has been reappropriating monitors that have cameras built into them yeah. and shifting well, monitors all over the building so that they have cameras where they need them for the teachers to do their remote stuff or whatever. And, that's uh, why I was pushing. They use those, those um, network cameras that they have that hack for so much earlier on in this pandemic because they weren't getting jerked up in price yet. Yeah. And they're Thank 1080p. You, Thank you, Matt. That's how I got mine. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> Dave Sika. Here I is. You have the, the, in your email, you have 6AV6 and 6AT6 backwards. The AV6 has the higher gain, according to my receiving two back. Well, well you know, I, I got it from an authoritative Wikipedia-like source, so it could have been right <laughs> or it could have been wrong. No, it's in, it's, uh, I, I got it out of here. Okay. Well, you know, it's, it's what just do they really know about remarkable. Too? All these things that you, you sort of, they kind of like fly past you and you see it and you don't really think about it. And, and you, I never really thought about it. But yeah, that was, that was a great question. Um, and the uh, and that that little white Arvin that I showed has the dreaded uh, 50B5 in it, so I better never show that to anybody from Underwriters Laboratories. They might confiscate it. <laughs> well, again, oh. I only I heard opinions about that. I don't know what the uh, what the actual situation was. Mm -hmm. You know, we, you, opinions on the internet they they have to be they have to be right. I mean, right. Just make, make sure Absolutely. you don't put a 50C5 in there by mistake, or you'll see plenty yeah. of flames and smoke. Yeah, yeah, I know they're not, their pins are all different. The pinout is all different. Yeah, yeah I, I accidentally did that once. I think everybody. All, 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 all it resulted in was a burnt <laughs> resistor. I think everybody's done it and burned up a resistor. And definitely don't put a 50A5 in. I don't remember, the, I don't even remember the tube number, but there was a tube. I had a cute little Ico mono amp and it used two 6BQ5s as push-pull output and it used a, a similar looking tube as the rectifier and you can guess what happened. It's a C rectifier. CA4. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. It's, mm. a, it's a big, tall, nine-pin miniature. 6CA4 with cross plates. Yeah. And yeah. and the, the one of the 6BQ5s accidentally, because somebody wasn't paying attention, got plugged into the rectifier socket and exciting things happened. But only once, right? Only once, yes. <laughs> now, John, I got to ask you a question. Did you rectify that problem after you? <laughs> I also use language that I, I won't repeat here because this is a family-oriented, uh, uh, although it is later in the evening. So. Yeah, it's almost 11. Do you know where your children are? <laughs> and last night was pro arguably the best Twilight Zone. Oh, which one? Time the it up at last? The Lonely, the one with um, Jack Warden and my name's Alicia, what's your name? The, you know, the robot. That is a, that's a really, really good one. The one where they have the replacement made? 
No, no, no. This is the oh, one. Oh, the where planet. He, well, like he's a prisoner on the planet. Yeah, he's in solitary on an asteroid, and they yeah. bring him. And they shoot him, or they shoot oh, it at the yeah, end. Yeah. 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 They, they bring That's it a up. half an hour one. Yes, that yeah. is a half an hour. That's uh, her, her. The actress's name is Jean Marsh, and, and years later she's on Johnny Carson. I was, I, uh, my brother pointed out a Johnny Carson YouTube video to me from, you know, an excerpt from his show, and I would have never recognized her. And my brother said, you know who that is? And I said, no. He said, that's the woman that played. That's the robot. That's the robot. Yeah, they couldn't say robot on the Twilight. Yeah, it was a robot or robot. Or, robots. Yeah. That was a really depressing episode. Yeah, it was I remember really seeing good. that. I'm like, geez, asshole. <laughs> yeah, they brought her in a big, big wooden box. They have, and people yeah. Supplies. It's just a robot. It's a woman in a box. Well, a robot. I'm, robot. I'm gonna say good night, guys. I'm gonna. I'm gonna say good night. I'll. I'll see you. Yeah, maybe. me too. Next, next yeah, meeting though. It was. This was. This was another great one. I'm. Uh, yes, I'm really pleased with how we're we're kind of hanging in in the in the tough times here. <laughs> yep. Yep. See you guys. Hey, hey. Yep. See you. I'm you. glad they switched back to the. Oh, he bailed. What? Say it's good that they switched back to the 30 hour or 30 minute episodes. Then they must be circling back around. Where are you guys watching them on? Me TV. Oh, okay. They yeah, have, I mean, you know what it is, but they like. I remember I was watching Mash a couple years ago, and they were in they were in order, and I remember like missing an episode or two, or two, and I'm like, who the hell are all these people? Because it was just it was enough of a chance where they like the whole cast changed. I'm like, who the hell are all these people? And I realized they looped all the way back around, and it was like the pilot, and that was why I didn't know anybody because half the people in the pilot are different in the next episode. And the syndicated Mash episodes are missing about five minutes overall. A lot of scenes missing from them. I believe it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the I, is that I the sticking commercials this. or what? No, they just cut. I, I guess for more commercials when it's syndicated because uh, there's one classic episode. Um, uh, if you remember the show, Henry Blake, who uh, was there before Potter, um, he had oh. this. Cr he had a. Hey. What? I said, "Oh, Henry Blake." Yeah, yeah. I remember. Anyway, he had a crush on this young nurse. He was trying to make himself look better. So uh, he's out there training one day, and Hawkeye's pacing him with the Jeep. And Henry Blake stops, and Hawkeye says, Henry, your hair is bleeding. And so, you know, black stuff coming above his hair. Well, the scene they cut out was that Henry Blake had put shoe polish in his hair to make himself look younger. And they cut that yeah, scene. Do that too. Nobody knew why his hair was bleeding black. Hmm. Yeah, I, I wish I could get me TV where I am here, but they only they only seem to do broadcasting, and I'm I'm far I'm far enough away from Scranton and in a valley, so trying to get anything over antenna is too much of a pain in the ass. And just about everything I have, I stream with the Roku. The worst part of watching Mash on me TV is if you lose a Mash roulette and end up with like goodbye radar or the one of the ones that are really sad you know like oh yeah like the one they they announced the guy get killed or you get the one like the pot like the ending one and it's like yeah. oh man i didn't even want to come home to be depressed <laughs> hey, hey john if you need an antenna i got this device that turns your entire house wiring into a big antenna <laughs> that sounds horrible <laughs> Yeah, the, yeah, I, I've I, I've got that d device too. You know, if if I want it, I'll bring my mother's washing machine up here to Pennsylvania and run that, and it'll make it all the wiring and antenna, so you can't receive anything on AM. Just feed your gutter, feed your gutter and your dance mat. See if that works. Guaranteed to work. Just turn your house into one big antenna. That's right. What do you do if you have wooden gutters? You have wooden gutters? Oh. And that the hell has And, and you have wooden to, gutters, have they to work when there's water in them. Isn't a wooden gutter like a trough, like a horse trough? No, I don't, I don't know. No, my, my grandmother's house had wooden gutters. They're called Yankee gutters or box gutters, by the way. Hmm. Well, That's the Yankee, proper gutter, the Yankee gutter was on the roof itself, not under the eaves. Well, well no. A Yankee gutter is built into the roof. It's part of the roof. 
That's what I mean. It's, you know, the same thing with a box cutter. But, again, you know, that, that's another one. My mom's house was from 1850, so it had those. Yeah, and yes, they were wood, but they were lined with metal. Yeah, I was going to say, just put copper flashing in them. Yeah, no, no, sorry, Steve. There's there when it comes to FM radio or you know a television That's signal, where where I am physically located, it, you have block. you have a hell of a time. Yeah, I'm, I'm literally good. in a valley, and I've got right in front of my house, which is the direction where all the stations are. Right. Unless you're going, unless you're going into the Catskills, which there's. Really I live in a mini. I live in a bowl. I, I, I call it Death Valley for RF. So I I know what you mean. Yeah, you know, I, I I've got I've got four hundred feet of rock in front of my house. Yeah, you know, it just goes straight up. So and unless <laughs> I put up a a tower or something, I, I think uh, TV is out of the question. And I have a friend who lives at the top of the hill though, and he's got a digital. Yeah, you know, he he gets it in somewhat. It's you know he's got a roof antenna and a converter box, and it's still constantly cutting in and out. No. You, can go, you, can go to, you can always go to Direct TV. That'll work. I was just gonna say satellite. Is satellite an option for you? Until it rains. Oh no, no way. If you see the sky, it is. Yeah, no, no, not 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 a freaking chance. Wait, Dude, I, I I I'd have to mount the satellite up at the top of a tree. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna but, say we're some. Yeah, well, we are. Yeah, well, we are here. The low on the horizon, so you gotta. So you got, you got. You know. Yeah, no, no, and that's the other thing is, I don't really have a clear view behind my house. What's funny is, you go uh, about a half mile up the road here, and the sun sets a half mile up the road. Forty minutes later than it does where my house is. You live in Sleepy Hollow. I mean, it's literally, it's, it's like you're in a bowl and you're surrounded by mountain and could transmit everything at a dish, but I don't think you can receive. Well, I can receive AM fine at night. Yeah, and actually there's good. one, there's one, there's a couple of local stations that if you're running a good, you know, a long wire antenna or you're running um, something that's a, actually a decent radio you can pick up during the day, but that's about it. You know, anything on FM, you're going to, you'll, you'll, you'll get it in okay, but not great. Um, so, and besides, as far as cable goes, I can get cable. I just, you know, for, for the two channels that I watch on cable, I'm not, yeah. I'm not paying. I'm Worth not paying it. the eighty dollars a month. Okay, I understand that. Yeah, I, 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 like I said, I have this little Roku box which costs thirty dollars, and just about everything I could possibly want on cable and a lot more, and it costs me zero dollars a month. It's just the only things, the only things that I missed were my local news station when I got rid of cable. But they since have come out with an app. And the only other thing I missed was um, MeTV. Well, what is your local station? Channel 69? The one in Lehigh Valley? No, 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 no. That's, that's, way, that's way south of me. Um, uh, uh, cha Channel 16 out of Wilkesburg. Wilkesburg, okay. Uh, that's, that's the sister ch station to um, 69. Okay. WNEP, but like I said, they have um, they have an application, so I can get the news. But uh, Me TV does not have a application that I can run on Roku yet. Well, they have a network, and I think they must have at least ten stations in the Eastern Seaboard that you can get oh, it. They, on. They, they, I think they have more than that, Steve. Maybe. Yeah, I, I, I was surprised I, to find that out. I, I just mean, watched over, the one in Wilmington. Yeah, well, the Me TV up here is actually sixteen two, which is um, WNEP also. Oh, okay. 
but you know, like I said, they they do over the air broadcasts and cable broadcasts, Absolutely. but I just yeah. can't pick them up. Yeah, well, pick them up fine in Philly over the air or on cable. So, and uh, they're in the cheapest data plan. I mean, TV plans you can get that include you know the lower fifty channels. So they're fine. And that's that's kind of sad, but hmm. Well, let's put it this way: for the eighty dollars a month that it would cost me, I I miss the station, but I just don't miss it that much. I, I like that station when I'm in shell shock and horror from watching any re, you know real channel, uh, except maybe comedy TV or something like that, or even you know it's just an escape. Yeah, it's like comfort food for me. I wish they yeah, would take up Audi duty or some something, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But today was really incredibly bummer. The whole day that History Channel had all this stuff that we've been talking about. And uh I hadn't thought about it in years. Uh but even my my son, who's, who was four and a half, he remembers everything he saw. And they closed schools down here, you know, 50 miles away from the city. And in Philadelphia, you know, 90 miles away, all the, all the, all the, uh, there were some sensitive points that were definitely shut down. And they went for, they decided to close down Independence Hall and maybe some other national monuments because they thought they were symbolic they'd be kind of like the Statue of Liberty. That was shut down all bit. Uh, and working in the health department, we all pretty much got deputized into Homeland Security for a while. Uh, and we had the anthrax within a few days. <laughs> and the whole situation was ridiculous. Yeah, and I, 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 re I remember that, that too. I remember the anthrax. And there was a post office near my mom's yeah. that was shut down for five years. Well, where's your mom? No, that was the that was the post office that we had to go in and clean out. You know, is, is that you're talking about the one? It was a Trenton mailing address. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, was in yeah. Hamilton on um, Route One Thirty. Right. right. Yeah. And they deputy they they got all the occupational health people who were part of my group. They said, well, you're in. You can be heroes now. And everyone's going, well, we don't want to be heroes. You know, nobody knew what that anthrax was going to amount to. Uh, and, uh, and furthermore, just about three blocks from my house, they identified a post, post you know, a, drop, a mail drop box. And some of the anthrax had come through there. And we were getting our mail in plastic envelopes. And one woman I knew who had a lab uh, where she, she used to specialize in penguins and go down to uh, Antarctic and, you know, and play with penguins and come back. She had some kind of funny uh, boxes that she could, you know, isolate them in, you know, without harming them, some kind of glove box. And uh, they confiscated everything in her lab. And I guess she was a person of interest. And uh, yeah, you know, it's all crazy. And then, they never really convinced everybody that they got the right guy. The one who I know when that guy. anthrax thing was a thing, all the mail was going through my hometown. We had some sort of machine in some one of our factory called Beta Beam, and it had some sort of nuclear beam thing where they would ra irradiate the mail. And I remember the building had they like ten feet deep cement walls or something like that, and they'd blast all the mail. Oh, that's how they cleaned all the. Uh, mail At the time, the they did. So they brought it out to you first, and that's why everything was delayed about a month. Well, I don't think it was literally <laughs> every piece of mail. I'm imagining they prioritized the mail that they were, you yeah. know, I imagine they didn't scan your copy of Maxim. I imagine it was all the, you know, the stuff that was important, the letters to senators and things like that, you know. And then, and then where I had lived previously, and my father was still living, Allentown, they had, you know, anthrax passed through. 
that post office, but that post office was so freaking small, they were able to clean it within a day. Yeah, you know what? Right. Uh, that, that Hamilton post office, though, that was unbelievable. That's they huge, right. <laughs> it was shut down for years. I think they, they, they finally uh, uh, sterilized it with, what was it, chlorine trioxide or dioxide? Do you remember? I'm really high. I forget, and I should know. Nearly react, yeah. Chlorine. Highly react. Chlorine. Yeah. See you, Phil. Maybe, maybe it was. See you, Lenny. Yeah, the, the, that, that Hamilton post office, I swear, was literally after they opened it back up, Steve. You know, it's quadruple the size of what it was when you guys were working in there now. They've expanded onto the side of it. They've expanded onto the back, and they built another building across the street from it. It's unfreaking believable. Well, so pay to play. Uh, I think they actually did. They have that whole building under a big plastic hood. Sure, yeah. yeah, like an ET. Yeah, parts yeah. of it. I think exactly they did. when they pumped it full of the chlorine dioxide. Right. Yeah. Wow, it's all very freaky. And I got a letter from my director, and it said, Stephen Miller is authorized to drive all over the streets uh, of, of uh, New Jersey in case of a lockdown. And I said, what am I supposed to do with this? They said, well, you have institutional knowledge, which means we don't give a damn what happens to you. You're old, and you, you know, just drive around. But I saved the letter. I don't know where I put it. Yeah, well, that's not going to do you any good if you don't have it with you. Well, I don't want to drive around. It's a, do I really want to be driving around in my leaky old gut bucket car if, if it's, you know, chlorine gas event or, or uh, Salem goes down or whatever? Uh, that's another thing I forgot to mention while Richard and the others were waxing eloquent. There's a big chlorine plant uh, outside of Jersey City, right near uh, the water there, you know, in the bay. And everybody was free is still freaking out over it because it's such a target. If you really want to do real damage, forget dropping small nuclear devices off the Empire State Building. Go for the chlorine dioxide plant, or what, I'm not dioxide, the chlorine plant and outside of Jersey City, that'll take out, whoa, an awful lot of Jersey in the north, but it'll all go, I guess the winds are usually northerly, and it'll take care of an awful lot of New York, lower New York State. And that's really nasty stuff. Yeah, that's that's all up in Kearney and Elizabeth and that right, area. Right, 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 the, right. The, the, the chemical coast. Right. And I don't know if they've done anything to harden any of those, they call them targets. You're not allowed to keep that much on site. Well, I don't think there's any shortage of targets in this area. It's not like yeah. they have to look for one. You right. can pick all, like, you know, the water supply, yeah. like the thousands of bridges and tunnels. There's a million easy targets that would screw a lot of people over. Yeah, well, as it turned out, the pandemic freaked everybody out before we were all hyped for bioterror agents. And by the way, Ebola was considered a bioterror agent. And, and we, then we, you know, later in life, they would say, if I say, Ebola, you're talking about Ebola, that's a bioterror agent. And somebody would look at me and say, some doctor would say, we don't call it that. And I said, okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Now well, it looks like nobody's left. But the what do you want us to leave? No, I mean, you know, I'm counting myself. So. Even my uh, cat start, you know, stopped Steve, screaming at me. You talk about targets. I remember quite a few years ago at this point, um, I'll say it was 1997, there was uh, a tanker truck on the Staten Island Expressway carrying oxygen that developed a leak. 
<laughs> and it, it, so many close calls. It, it completely paralyzed Staten Island because it was on the expressway in Willowbrook where the, the driver stopped. So that plugged um, access to the Bayonne Bridge, the Gothels Bridge, the Verrazano Bridge, Victory Boulevard, uh, you know, Forest Avenue. It, it, it was it was just such a, a plug. It, it was incredible. They, well, they had a, absolutely nuts. They had a propane tank on the turnpike. I want to say it was maybe about. Uh, oops. I think it was back in um, February, and I was caught in the traffic jam in the morning. And the propane tanker, there was an accident, and it started leaking, and it caught fire, but it did not explode. They they ended up just waiting there for it to burn everything off. Jesus, <laughs> but God. it was, but it took like twelve hours before everything burned. You have to look up the 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 chemical uh, stats for propane. It may have a low. It may have a high. L E L, which is the C three H eight. Okay, <laughs> you look it up. <laughs> no, I just remember that C three H eight's propane. That's uh, good. I don't remember that. Uh, anyway, you know, the the other but one it is that... tricky. Like gasoline doesn't quite explode, does it? But it's very flammable. Yeah, the vapor is explosive. On yeah, that. the vapor. See what I've been working on? My proton pack's getting a lot bigger. Did you tap those screw holes yet? Yeah, I've been doing that the whole meeting, and it barely made a difference. It's just shitty hardware. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you did something constructive or destructive. Yeah, real constructive, making toys. Hey, hey, Frank, I see a Zenith radio cabinet over your shoulder there. Are you working on the chassis? Yes, the chassis is completed. I just haven't tested it yet because uh, there was some controversy on the type of power supply it was. Uh, usually you figure the choke is on the positive side, but in this one they put the choke on the negative side. So, and it's a ballast set, so, you know, and it's, a, it's a one of the lower end zeniths. It's not the top of the line, but it's 1937, and it's a black dial, so I carefully worked on that today and of course I put the pointer on uh, the way it was and whoever worked on it before me put the pointer on upside down but I'm not taking it apart to put it the right way it's you know who's going to be there notice? from Australia maybe yeah maybe it was a down under set that's that's a good good, good uh, possibility but uh, it's uh it's a work in progress. I was just cleaning the, the cabinet up a little bit and I'm uh, putting new uh, bushings in the bottom to bring the, uh, the uh, chassis at the right level because the other ones looked like squished, squished muffins <laughs> because it was the original ones. They look horrible. And yeah, yeah, they always do at this point. Yeah, yeah and, well, and they, were, they were not regular rubber either. They were gum rubber. Which yeah. Softer. Yeah. So I had bought the rubber bushings for it ages ago, and somehow I managed to save them in one of my my arch drawers. And uh, matter of fact, this this is the new ones. Yep. That go in there, and I found I got I had actually bought bushings that are solid ones for my Philco that I have. A Foco tombstone because it has the same thing. You have to put bushings in it to raise the chassis off the uh, off the wood. Those are pretty big bushings. Well, it's it's a heavy chassis. It's you know it's not a yeah wow. Yeah, you know, it's like a quarter quarter inch yeah. hole. They look like what's it made out of? Bushings. Is that rubber? Is yeah, it rubber? is. Yep. rubber. You, you you know why they put those bushings in there? Because it probably know. resonated like a mother effer. No. No. See, a lot of the manufacturers had multiple sources for building the cabinets. Ah. So, so all the chassis were the same, but 
but one might have a thicker base than the other or be a little bit shorter than the other. So what uh -oh. they would do is they'd put those bushings in and they'd crank the screws down until the chassis was sitting at the right height inside the cabinet. Ah, that's what it is. But here's one of the originals. Yep. Wow. It looks like I, a camouflage. <laughs> it, it's pretty well beat up, as you can see. That's 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 where the chassis actually sits. Where did you get the uh, the bushings from? Renovated radios. I forget where. I think I might have got them from uh, from Arizona, from uh, AES. Yeah, I think I think they get them from re renovated radios, though. They probably what, what's, do. What's weird is renovated radios. You would think. Um, would be the cheapest place to get them because they make most of the stuff, but they are not. You know, yeah. unless you're really buying bulk, they are not a good place to get that stuff. A perfect example is, hold on a second here. So, so actually, my parts bins are right behind me. So, here is the proper motor grommet for a 45 record changer. Right, right. This is gum rubber one, which is softer. They make replacements that are black rubber. And they're harder but, to get in. But the black rubber, it's not that it's harder to get in. They're about the same to get in, but black rubber doesn't have a lot of give and can actually transfer some of the motor noise right, and vibration right. to the yeah. turntable and platter and it causes compliance issues with the cartridges. But renovated radios are the only one who, ones who make these. However- they make, they make the proper density rubber. The other however, ones are higher, higher density, I guess. However, I can get them on eBay cheaper than I can get them from renovated radios, but renovated mm -hmm. radios makes them. And you know, I'd buy them like, you know, enough to do 40 changers at a time. Mm -hmm. The same with these guys. These are for the, um, if you've never worked on one of those, it does not have springs underneath the um, changer board right. to dampen the vibration like a normal turntable. It's right. got, again, these rubber cone bushings. Right. And Renovated Radios has them, but I can get them cheaper from voiceofmusic.com which I think buys them from renovated radios in the thousands. That's probably what it is. If they buy such a bulk, they could give, they pass on the savings to you. Yeah, but you would think that the place that was making the damn things could pass on the savings to you. Yeah, and it, it's, it's funny how the opposite could be true in that case. Um, I have two, two uh, changes. I have a, a standalone that I have sitting on top of a RCA uh, bullhorn mm -hmm. and I'm thinking I'm buying they have a three pack of the aluminum idlers uh, and so I'm probably going to do that one and I have one that's got the built in amp that I bought years ago it has, it's the, the bake light model with the lid Frank you mean these yeah yeah there's, they, they, I saw it on eBay. I, I, I bookmarked they, it. They are absolutely fantastic. And, yeah. and whoever is doing them, if you place your eBay order for those, now they're coming from California. I'm, I'm on the other side of the country here, you know, in Pennsylvania. I usually have them in two days from when I place the order. Well, they kind of down here in Florida, they kind of mosey the mail, so it will probably be about five. Well, days. usually, <laughs> usually the mail is moseyed up by me too. The stupid motor grommets. Um, uh, actually, that's a double order of what I normally order because the first package took over a month and it still wasn't here because the postal system's been so screwed up. Um, that I ordered another one and I said. Listen, you know, I don't want a refund for the other one yet. We'll wait another month, but I need you to overnight me, you know, some of these. And they both ended up coming the same day. That's, that, that's weird. That is weird. 
And I mean, it wasn't. But that's, it wasn't, but that's, the, that's the postal service. I worked. It wasn't. For that. It wasn't the seller fucking things up because I could see the tracking. Yeah. Yeah. And somewhere in Los Angeles, they disappeared for a month and a half. Well, at least they came back. I think some things just disappear forever. And well, yes, they're getting worse. I know they're getting worse. And and you know the the the. Whatever they call these shenanigans that have been going on right recently, they have had a bad effect here. I don't know about where you are, Steve, but up where I am, so, some of the postal workers are actually drunk on the job. Oh, yeah. I've, uh, seen, I've, I've, I've had, seen that. I've experienced that firsthand. I, I've, I, I've had, we were doing, I guess it was a year ago. <laughs> and you're, you're dodging the question. They've always been drunk. A certain fraction are always drunk. But this business of privatizing them right now suddenly is is bad news, and it's had a deleterious effect. And it's not the fault of them being a bunch of maniacs. You know, it's it's because all of a sudden they lost machines and boxes. You know, well, this is going to go know, in a political dumped, direction. Yeah, somebody dumped a bunch of uh, uh, plastic bags uh, that were supposed to be, oh, I forget the specifics of it. They were left in a parking lot. I guess it was in another state. But uh, so they, the post office had no clue. Oh, it was bulk mail, and it was a lot of it. And some yeah, that, 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 that's, that's not that unusual. You get one postal worker that says, fuck, I'm going to go home for the day. <laughs> that's, what, that's what happens. Uh, my favorite up here was, you know, right after I moved up here, we literally, there's like, there's like 450 houses in the subdivision. I'm going to say maybe a third of them actually get mail because the rest are people's vacation homes. And I'll never forget, we, I went to pick up my mail one day and there were notes. All the boxes are in one area that you have to drive to. And there were notes on the post office boxes, was running late for a doctor's appointment. I'll deliver today's mail tomorrow. <laughs> you mean they didn't that's, put them? That's when you know you're in a rural area. Well, at yeah. least you left a note. They didn't put them in the boxes. They, they didn't put them in your post, little postal things, whatever those are, you know? Is no, no they, 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 they just hung a couple of signs on the 200 plus boxes. Right, but when they say deliver, they just mean sort them into your boxes, right? Well, yeah, that's part of the delivery. <laughs> okay, that's the only part. I had one once in uh, Valley Forge, near Valley Forge, and we used the Valley Forge post office. And I think a lot of people who had those post office boxes just didn't want a mailman up near their neighborhood because it was such a snooty neighborhood. Uh, they didn't even want me in their neighborhood. And, wow. uh, Gee. but they were pretty good. Most stuff came through. Every once in a while you'd get an action like you just mentioned. No, we're gonna close. It's, uh, it's our time and we're sorry that you're a minute late. Oh no, 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 no. The Holy Post Office sucks. They suck, and they've always sucked. I've been down there arguing and screaming at the Postmaster General. You know, I, I finally had it after a check that I, you know, it was a $600 check that was written to me, ended up in the lake. Wow. It ended up in the lake, and we found it on cleanup day after I had canceled the chat or had to have the person cancel yeah, yeah, had a, and right send another one. And this is the other thing. Anything that I mail out up here, unless I drive over to the other side of Lake Wall and Paw Pack to Green yeah, Drive. That where you are? You're up yeah. near Wall and Paw Pack? Okay. If I if I drive to Green Dryer Township or any of the other towns and I mail something, it'll get to whatever its destination is within a week. If I send it out up here, it might get there within a week or it might take a month. So you're saying your post office is bad. Your oh, particular, your no, 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 no. It's horrible. 
It's not okay, bad. Wait. It's biblically bad. So it's and a it's, been, it's, it's a sore like, thumb. Oh no 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 no! <laughs> it's 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 infected and there are maggots coming out of it. Yeah, you know, and it's posing. been this it's been this way since I moved up here. The best thing that happened though was our mailman that delivered to the community changed after you know I walked in with video of the guy sucking down a bottle of Jack Daniels on the back of his pickup truck was after it just he delivered Black? the mail. <laughs> Was it J.D. Black? Yes, it was. Good. <laughs> All right. So you do have a bad post office. Oh, no, it's, it's, it, it's, it's unbelievable. I never had, you know what? I, the local post office I dealt with in New Jersey, okay. You know, the people were slow in there. They had a bad attitude, but, but you never really had an issue. Right, right. You know, and the one I dealt with in Allentown when we lived there was wonderful. That was never an issue. Okay. My, my mailman is like suspiciously the friendliest, nicest person I have ever met in my life for whatever reason. So I'm like, <laughs> I don't have the problems you have. Well, it actually you know, concerns me that he's so friendly. <laughs> no, the mailman, the mailman we had delivering in Bordentown was fine. The people who worked in the post office though um were you know they they had an attitude issue but again it wasn't these are the people in the office the counter yeah. guys from this guy i've ever met it's like mr mcfeely <laughs> <laughs> well that's good yeah you know? um but no no that was that was an adjustment up here was you know, okay, you know what, if I want something to get through in the mail, all right, I'm going to have to plan because I'm going to have to drive a half hour and put it, you know, in a different box, or I'm going to have to go to FedEx and pay to send it out. Well, when I lived on Staten Island, when it, wherever you mailed the mail, even at the GPO on Staten Island, it all gets trucked to Brooklyn for sort. <laughs> it, it actually leaves the borough goes to a different borough for sorting. So, you know, I don't know what to say. Uh, it, it, when I left New York, they had gotten rid of most of the old timers and had hired m almost all new people. Um, I put in the change of address because I had already, already bought the house, so now I, I knew what the deal was. I put in the change of address about two months before I moved, and a month before I moved, I, I told the letter carrier, and she was, oh, so pleasant. And the only way I was able to get my mail to be forwarded was when I cable tied the mailbox closed, because as soon as I left, all the smiles were really, pardon the French, this, and she was leaving all my mail on Staten Island, knowing full well I was already down here in Virginia. I moved myself, so I was going back and forth. And this is how I knew she was dumping all the mail in front of the building on Staten Island. Your Thank building. You. Your ex building, right? Correct. Correct. So then I cable tied, the mailbox closed, and went to the, the, the local, you know, post office. And I said, look, you know, the change of address, this, that, and the other thing. He said, it's really up to the letter carrier, whether your mail gets forwarded or not. That's the responsibility of your individual letter carrier. So yeah, I but they're supposed to tell them. Me. Why does it make sense? Like, why would it even get to the letter carrier? It should be redirected at the post office. Maybe that's how they do it. I don't know. Uh, uh, Matt, Matt, that might be the way they do it nationally, but I'll just give you the line that the people in the Holy Post Office gave me. Well, they don't understand how we do things here. Yeah, well, it sounds like you just have problems with shitty people. Well, in that's, general. that's, you know, Pennsylvania is supposed to be. Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Alabama in between. So you, you guys are hill people now. 
Uh, it's listen. You know, I have no issue with it being Hooterville up here. You know, but uh, but he uh, just told you they don't understand the way we do things. What's yeah, that sound well, like? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, like I. Well, my favorite was when I first moved here. This house had been vacant for over ten years, and the address change happened during that time. Now. I, I don't know. I've I've never bought a house anywhere other than Pennsylvania, but you know, at closing, you don't get your deed. The deed has to be sent off by the lawyer to the recorder of deeds, I and can't you know, and then yeah. they mail it to you. Whatever, it's all bureaucracy. Well, anyway, I and I I had to go back and forth between the township building the Holy Post Office and the counter, county courthouse for three weeks because they couldn't decide what my address was. <laughs> yeah, I heard that before. You mentioned that, yes. It, it, was, it was unbelievable. And finally, I ended up going to um, my, my local, you know, assemblyman's office <laughs> because they were arguing, you know, I knew the house was supposed to be 22 Sheridan Road. But the one place, the post office is telling me it's 52 Sheridan Road. The township is telling me that it's um, 153 Sheridan Road. And, and the county, which sets the 911 addresses, is telling me it's 22 Sheridan Road. So I, I ended up having to get an assemblyman from the state involved, his office, to get them all to agree on what my address was. And luckily it happened just in time so that there was a mailing address for the deed of the house to go to. Oh, you're talking about the deed. Okay. <laughs> all right. Yep. But, but, but okay. it was, 